the 7 p.m. And can we go ahead and get a roll call, please? Council Member McQuay? Here. Council Member Nason? Here. Council Member Tiedemann? Here. Vice Mayor Jordan? Here. And Mayor Gary? Here. Yeah. Thank you, Mayor. We'll go ahead and move down to line item number three. Uh, there is no reportable actions at this time for any closed session. No ceremonial matters. We'll go ahead and move down to line item number five, which is the city manager's report. Thank you, Mayor. I'd like to um, thank everyone that attended our recent flag raising for the Confederated Villages of Lijon. It was a great community event. Everyone was masked and safe and celebrating. And so really just thank the community for that historical day. We will be posting a bunch of information on our website that is forthcoming on all of the initiatives that have been taken over the past years to forward diversity, equity, and inclusion, including this flag raising. Uh, staff from multiple departments in the city met with representatives from UC Berkeley and the city of Berkeley regarding the encampments that have been noted, also noted to the city council uh, along Cordonese's Creek that are on UC Berkeley property. We will continue coordinating on this matter with UC Berkeley as the lead agency for this particular property site. Uh, fall reminder from Public Works, uh, as we see the leaves fall, please be sure to collect those in your green bins and not left in the street for street sweepers as that can clog the street sweeping machinery. We also welcome two new engineers in the Public Works Department, James Shirelli and David Lamb, who are new to our team and I welcome them. And they have great big workloads ahead of them, so thank you for joining our team. The Albany Police Department was welcomed over to Belmont Village for um, an elder scam awareness training on October 11th and 12th. We had a great turnout at the event and I thank our staff for taking the time to help our community. We have a um, unexpected vacancy on the Economic Development Committee. Uh, this is the committee that advises the council on everything related to economic development within our city for vitality and economic development. Um, please see our website if you'd like to submit an online application for this great opportunity. And I'd like to um, give a special recognition to the Friends of Albany Seniors who hosted their annual white elephant sale and raised a significant amount of funds that directly support our senior center and our seniors. So thank you for their volunteer efforts to keep that great energy going. And that concludes my report, thanks. All right, thank you so much for your report. Let's see any hands up for any clarifying on your report. So I'll go ahead and move down to line number number six, which is the good a city for public comment. Um, this is a time where anyone in the city will have an opportunity to speak on something that is not on the agenda. You will have three minutes at this time if you'll go ahead and raise your hand and Ann will let you in for your comments. Hi, good evening, everybody. My name is Jeremiah and I just would like to share with uh, the city staff and the city council, uh, any resident in Albany, um, if you live in Albany and you have a California driver's license or a California ID that has an Albany address, you could show up to uh, 1600 Sacramento Street um, in Berkeley next to the North Berkeley BART station. It's on Sacramento and Cedar, it's so cross streets. It's a food bank, it's from the Alameda County Food Bank and it's open to all of the Albany residents. Um, they do not turn away homeless people if they don't have IDs, but this is mostly for families uh, in Albany that have refrigerators and freezers uh, because at this food bank you get Whole Foods donations, Sprouts donations, Trader Joe's donations, Costco donations, all from the Alameda County Food Bank. So this is your tax dollars at work actually coming back and stocking your refrigerator. But you just gotta show up. Um, so it's Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, every Monday and Wednesday, Friday from two o'clock PM to four o'clock PM. And I would advise getting there at two o'clock. Um, you know, just to get there early, check it out. 
and you literally walk away with over $200 in groceries. So let's say you have two people in your family. One person can go uh, one week and the other person can go two weeks later. And you can alternate every two weeks because I guess you're only allowed to go once a month to get four bags, but you can show up every time and still get two bags. But only once a month you can get meat, cheese, and dairy. But the rest of the times you can still get vegetables and um, all sorts of fun stuff. Um, I would advise showing up there and getting some free food to subsidize your grocery bill. Um, and that way all the stuff goes to waste because at the end of the day, I have pictures and all this strawberries and bananas is going in the trash. It's going right in the green bin. And it's so sad to see this food waste. So I do food recovery and literally take stuff out of the green. How's it going? Oh. And I go and do good things with it. So basically also, I just want to add one more thing that the school zones, um, uh, school zones for Albany, the transportation uh, commission actually has put it on their work plan. So I just want to give the city council a heads up that they have renamed it from school zones to like safety traffic speeds or something, reduce speeds. So finally, after 10 years of efforts, um, it's on the transportation work plan. And so that's going to be great uh, to help keep our schools safe and reduce the speed limit around our schools. So keep up the good job, city council. Thank you. Thank you for your comments. Is that it? Okay. I believe that's all the public comment at this time. We will go down to line number seven, which is our consent calendar. And I'll start with the city council first. Vice Mayor George. Seven, six, please. Council Member Nason. Council Member McClay. Seven, four. Member Tiedemann. All right, now we'll go out to the public. Now it's available. We'll start with Council Member McCoy, 74. Thank you very much. I believe there are members of the public wishing to speak on 74. which may not be true. Yes, um, Mayor, I see that Jack Kenny has his hand raised. All right, go ahead um, and go ahead and let him in two minutes, please. Hello, can you hear me? We can go ahead, please. Hi, my name is Jack Kenny. I'm an Albany resident and a member of the Albany Rotary Club. Uh, one of the designated polio warriors for our club. I'd like to speak in favor of the resolution that is recognizing World Polio Day on uh, the 24th. I think many people may think polio was conquered many years ago, but it's still out there with the possibility of a resurgence without a program to eliminate it. For many years, Rotary Clubs around the world have made eradicating polio a major focus. In the past year, Albany Rotary made the polio initiative one of our top goals for our club. We feel that we are so close to eradicating polio with only two cases of wild polio in the world so far this year that we have made it a, a push to increase our fundraising. Thanks to our members and the other Rotary Clubs in our district in Northern California, $270,000 was raised this year, and that had a double match from the Gates Foundation, bringing it to a total of $770,000. Uh, worldwide, Rotary members donated $50 million to this effort. We hope that these efforts will inspire people in our community to join with us, and hopefully they would like to donate to the initiative, and you can do so through the Albany Rotary Foundation and on the internet, that is www.albanyrotaryfoundation.org. So uh, we encourage people to contribute to that and join us in this effort. Thank you. Thank you so much. 
right, I'll go to Vice Mayor Jordan at 76. Yeah, if I may share my screen quickly, that's the fastest way to, okay. to uh, explain. <clears throat> thank you. So uh, thank, thank you, City Clerk. I tried to interpret um, uh, the motion from last time. Uh, it's my fault. I probably should have redlined the, the master fee schedule myself. So it was, it was uh, direct and straightforward. Um, my intention was not to zero out the fee for tree removal application in the city right of way, but rather to zero out the other fees that are shown here. And so that would be an amendment to this resolution, which I think is 21102. Um, it's not to, to leave this fee as is. So that fee is if somebody requests a tree removal of a tree that the city otherwise determines you know, does not need to be removed under its own criteria, if I understand correctly, and staff can correct my understanding if I'm misstating it. And that's it. All right, thank you so much. See if there's any questions. All right, seeing that, we'll go ahead and get a motion to move the consent for it. Uh, what? Yeah. Excuse me. Um, may I ask a question on the last item? Okay. Is there, I'm sorry, I, I, I kind of lost you. Is there a fee? If, is there, are there any fees for tree removal permits? Or is it your intent that they will always so, be the same fee? So there is an existing fee right. for tree removal. If the tree, and my understanding, and staff, you know, step in if I've got this wrong, but my understanding is that the tree is you know, an imminent hazard then that fee doesn't apply. You know, the city takes action to, to remove the tree of its own accord. But if the tree is in reasonable enough health, I mean, it can't be in perfect health because I think the city won't even agree to remove it then. So there's some gray area in between, but in whatever that gray area is, somebody can apply to have the tree removed and it's 200 some odd dollars for them to apply for that. And, you know, making that free would be counter to the goal here, which is more trees, not fewer. Okay, that's what I thought. I just wanted to be sure. Thank you. I appreciate that. All right. Any other questions? If not, we'll go ahead and get a motion to move the consent calendar for it. Go ahead, Vice Mayor Jordan. I will move the consent calendar with the adjustments to the resolution under item 7 6 to maintain the current charge for tree removal applications and to zero out the other charges as indicated in the attachment. I'll second that. All right, thank you. First and second, we'll go ahead and get a roll call, please, Anne. Council Member Tiedemann? Yes. Mayor Gary? Yes. Vice Mayor Jordan? Yes. Council Member McQuay? Yes. And Council Member Nason? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you so much. We'll go ahead and move down to line number number eight, which is a presentation. Eight one is a review of the advisory body work plan. And I'll ask for a staff report at this time. Good evening, Council. Tonight before you is the two year work plan for Planning and Zoning Commission. Staff's recommendation is the same as previous one is for the Council to review the work plans and provide any comments or direction on the work plans and approve the work plan. We have um, Liz Wadi, the Chair of Planning and Zoning Commission here to, pr to present. So if you give me a moment. Good evening, everyone. Uh, Madam Mayor, Honorable Council Members. I'm Liz Wadi, Chair of the Planning and Zoning Commission. I'm here this evening to present an overview of the Commission's accomplishments from the past two years and to present for your consideration and adoption the Planning and Zoning Commission's 2021 to 2023 work plan. First up, I'd like to highlight a few major achievements from the past two years. These include completion and adoption of the Accessory Dwelling Unit Ordinance, completion and adoption of a new sign ordinance, Establishment of a zoning classification for 755 Cleveland, known as the Saha Housing Project. 
review and approval of a nine unit subdivision with nine new townhouse units, including one affordable unit, which made use of the state density bonus law and review and approval of a 14 unit apartment building that includes two affordable units, which also made use of the state density bonus law. Next up, I'd like to highlight our productivity by numbers from the past two years. In 2019, 73 development applications were filed. Of those, the commission reviewed 26 residential remodels, three conditional use permits and one subdivision map. By contrast, in 2022, during this global pandemic, although we saw a minor dip in total applications with 68 filed, the commission actually saw a small uptick in volume with 28 residential remodels and four conditional use permits. Moving on to our upcoming work program uh, before you this evening, the Planning and Zoning Commission will continue to prioritize efforts that facilitate new housing development in Albany. These initiatives include developing the San Pablo Avenue specific plan, targeting adoption in winter 2022, adopting an updated housing element also by the end of 2022, and continuing to review development applications in a timely manner, including our recent review and approval of a new 207 unit mixed use project at 540 San Pablo Avenue, which is separately before you this evening under item 9-1. That concludes my presentation. And with that, we would respectfully request that you approve the Planning and Zoning Commission's work plan for 2021 to 2023. Should you have any questions, I'm joined this evening by Planning Manager Ann Hirsch. Thank you all. Thank you so much, Liz, for your um, presentation. I'll open it up for city council to ask any questions. No one has any? All right, I'll open it up. Oh, I'm sorry, Council Member Tiedemann, go ahead, please. Uh, thanks. Uh, uh, thank you for a short and sweet uh, presentation. Um, I just wanted to clarify, does, does this need a regular action instead of a one-time one about reviewing planning applications, you know, as normal, or is that defined enough in sort of the charter of this committee that doesn't need to be identified in this work plan? I'll maybe defer that question to planning and uh, manager Ann, if she's on the line. Uh, she's here in the audience and raising her hand, I believe. She'll be up momentarily. Okay, I'm uh, good evening, um, honorable mayor and council members. I'm Ann Hirsch, I'm the planning manager. Um, so to answer your question, council member Tiedemann, um, the planning applications is just kind of our regular workload and it is um, an explicit uh, chat, a task of the uh, planning and zoning commission. It is the majority of work that we do, which is why it's noted in there along with um, previous year uh, application um, tallies. So yeah, it's just kind of a part of our regular uh, course of doing business. That's what I figured, but wanted to confirm. Thank you. All right. Any other city council members? All right. Let's go to the public, see if there's any questions. Uh, looks like we have one. Go ahead, please. Uh, two minutes. If you're speaking, you're on mute. Can you hear me? We can. Go ahead, please. Okay, I have a question on uh, um, housing element. There is um, some you noted or the presenter presented uh, a group of houses with one affordable housing unit. I'd like to classify or clarify what is affordable in the city of Albany. The other thing is, are you using or taking into consideration diversity aspects because the housing element has to be completed in 2022 and signed out by the state of California and the government. Here's the deal with, with Albany. Within Albany's planning for additional housing, I'd like to know what you're looking at specifically. If you're looking at something to include affordable housing because you're not attracting right now people who are from diverse backgrounds to include in affordable housing. What are you making and how are you doing that? All right, thank you for your question. I'll go ahead and either Liz or Ann. Sure, I'm, I'm happy to jump in um, initially and then I'll hand it off to Ann as well. So the um, one affordable housing unit that was referenced in that nine unit project, that's uh, what we consider a inclusionary housing unit. So it's a result of a market rate private development 
Um, the city, the planning code does require an inclusionary unit when there's at least five units being proposed. Um, and and we'll have to provide the exact area median income, but an affordable housing unit is based on size of household as well as income level in general. Um, as it relates to the larger housing element, um, we are um, certainly focused on looking at um, the need for producing more affordable housing, especially in Albany. Um, and the primary source of providing those units is usually through market rate developments, such as the 540 San Pablo Avenue project that's on your agenda as well this evening. Um, but certainly there are other opportunities such as the um, other project that was referenced, the Saha project on Cleveland, um, where it's a separate um, agreement with an affordable housing developer and that um, obviously produces a higher volume of affordable housing units. But I will turn it over to Anne to provide a few more specifics as well. Thank yes, you. Um, the project that was uh, referenced is um, the Portland Keynes townhouse development, which is actually currently under construction. Um, and there is one unit as part of that project um, that is to be um, restricted at the low income um, status. So that means that the future occupants will um, have to you know, show proof of income that meets the, the criteria. The income and household size data requirements are actually published through Alameda County through their housing division. Um, and anyone can go on their website. It was updated at the end of June um, and it provides the latest information again, based on household size and um, median income. Okay. Thank you. I'd like to ask another question. If, since you can go on Alameda County's website and, and have that information, um, provided that's that's one thing, but I'm still concerned about uh, working with future developments <coughs> developers uh, that uh, you would have to zone housing for low income people. I'm wondering what part of the governmental money that was sent via infrastructure would be dedicated to helping you ass assist you in meeting the needs. Uh, a little bit more because one place for a criteria, okay, that's one, but I'm sure there's the residents of Albany that are low income would like to be able to um, establish some type of way of knowing that there are other places that might be developed for low income housing. No response. And, and do you have any follow-up for that question? Um, I don't really have any specific follow-up. Um, I'm not um, you know, aware right now of our um, you know, the federal money coming down. It hasn't been allocated yet, um, at least in kind of the world that, that you know, we're planning world. So that's, that's very much a, kind of a to be determined. Um, and I think the only thing I can really add to that is that you know, we're, we're very aware of um, you know, the regional housing needs, uh, as demonstrated in our uh, early start on the housing element, we've gone through three housing element meetings. We're going to continue with that going forward to stay on track for a 2022 completion. And we continue to work on housing development applications. Um, as Chair Wadi mentioned, we have 207 units we'll be looking at a little bit later on in this meeting. So we are very much, um, you know, attuned to, to housing policy and housing development in the city. Thank you so much for your question. Go ahead, it looks like Edward has his hand up. Go ahead, please. If you're speaking, you're on mute. Edward, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Hi, this is actually um, Edward's oh. wife. Okay, sorry. Speaking your own My, I am speaking now. Can you hear me? I can hear you. Go ahead, please. Um, the last couple of minutes have been unintelligible because two people have been speaking. Um, I'm not sure. Edward, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Hi, this is actually um, Edward's oh. wife. Okay, sorry. Speaking your own mute. My, there's I two am different speaking now. Can you hear me? Going on. I can hear you. Go ahead, please. Like, Ms. Hernandez, you need to turn off your um, video if you have YouTube video playing or something. Uh, Edward, if you're speaking, you're on mute. Uh, Hi, this is actually um, Edward. Oh. Okay, sorry. Speaking your own mute. I am speaking now. Can you hear me? Going on. I can hear you. Go ahead, please. 
Like, Ms. Hernandez, you need to turn off. I'm sorry, um, Ms. Hernandez, if you can raise your hand when you're ready to talk. Perhaps you can send, go ahead and send your comment to city council at albanyca.org. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. I'll go ahead and bring it back to city council for further discussion at this time. All right, with that said, okay, go ahead, Vice Mayor Jordan. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Wadi, for presenting this. Um, it's, a, it's a new template, so understandable that, that this has occurred. It's occurred with other bodies, but the, the goal of the template was to have um, line by line repeated from the prior work plan with indication of uh, if work was done, if the task was accomplished or not. And, and that's not included here. So for instance, in the prior work plan included soft story ordinance preparation. Um, when you go to the website and look at the prior work plan, but that's not included in the uh, prior work plan um, update section in this work plan that's presented to us. So um, I'm sure we're not proposing to hold this up, um, but I am interested in having that, that this version of the plan amended with that so that we have a record of what was worked on and what wasn't, because that helps us understand capacity down the line. So that's, you know, obviously a, a proposal to um, the council members for whatever motion gets made to pass this. Uh, as far as items that I would be interested in having added, um, I will be no surprise. I'm interested in having that item added, um, soft story ordinance preparation, since that has not been completed um, and it is a strategic plan item for the council. And then the potential work plan um, items, I will propose adding Measure K Albany Hill specific plan. And that needs to be looked at again um, I won't go into that any, any further unless somebody wants to talk about it. Um, when you're done, my, Vice Mayor Jordan, actually, I do want to discuss that issue um, when, when the time is appropriate. Great. Um, and then the other item I have on my list for a potential work plan um, is off three park, car parking minimums in R1, in the R1 zone. So Albany's taking action in the R2 and R3. I think it would be worth a uh, you know, conscious overlook at R1. Uh, maybe that nothing is recommended to change, but again, as a potential work plan item, because I know there's a lot on the plate with the housing element. And I perhaps to take council member Tiedemann's uh, question, it's a good question for the next step. I think it would be useful for the public to see under recurring action items. However, um, staff and or the commission wants to put a uh, processing of uh, planning applications, since that is, uh, uh, as I think was described, the bulk of the work. Um, I think it's good to list those items that constitute most of the work on the work plan so that anybody who looks at it gets a gets a good picture of what the body does. Right. Go ahead, Ann. Uh, I just want to clarify on Measure K. Um, right now, it's actually... Um, technically part of the housing element. Um, the Measure K ballot uh, initiative that goes back to 1994 would require a vote um, of the people to for any amendments and it, that language would have to be authorized by the city council. In order to do that as a city sponsored initiative, uh, we have to do a robust CEQA analysis. Um, unfortunately, it's not as simple as um, simply putting ballot language on, on a forthcoming ballot. So. Our uh, intent is to make that part of the housing element and have a CEQA analysis, which is already budgeted as part of that effort, encompass uh, what would have to be done for Measure K and then bring Measure K back once the housing element is, is complete and put it on a future ballot. Okay, well, that, that's that's great. That's better than uh, I expected, although more work, it sounds like. Um, I think it would be useful to capture Measure K by word somehow in the work plan, just so that we all know it's there. Um, I understand 
it's in the works behind the scenes, but but I like to have these sort of larger items tracked and writing um, for reference purposes. So I don't know if you have a place you would recommend that it might appear. Um, but I, for my part, and council members may disagree, I would like it to appear somewhere in the work plan. I think what would be best is to make that an explicitly stated component of the housing element effort, just so that it's it's there, it's documented, and it's um, recognized as part of this other planning effort that we're working on. Great. And may I ask one clarifying question? Um, you briefly mentioned um, the current planning application um, uh, you know, work that we do. And I'm curious if um, in the interest of you know, the next work plan, would it be helpful to simply provide um, the index of planning applications? And what, what we do is, you know, identify that by property address and project scope. Um, it's a very simple snapshot, but it gives a complete picture year by year of the workload that comes through um, in the current planning realm. Yeah, thanks. Uh, speaking only for myself, I don't think that level of detail is needed. I think the, the count that was provided is adequate. Um, and at least for my part, I know, I think where to go on the website to, to find those details if, I, if I'm after them. Um, so I, I think just the count is good enough. Um, and given that it appeared in the past accomplishments, I think it's reasonable to, to include it again as a recurring action item because I expect it will appear in the future accomplishments. And so that way, when the, this work plan is repeated line by line in the next work plan, that box can be checked. Yes, this is done and here's how many were done. Thank you. Thank you. Right, any other council members have any questions? All right, with that said, I'll go ahead and ask for a motion to move this forward to approve the plan. All right, I will move approval of the Planning and Zoning Commission's work plan with the following adjustments, the housing element item to be adjusted to reflect that it is also addressing uh, potential measure K out language and or analysis. Um, another one time action item is the development of a seismic retrofit or soft story ordinance uh, preparation. And in the potential Work plan items is off street car parking minimums in R1. And then finally, adding into the recurring action items, the uh, planning application um, consideration and processing. Councilman McQuay. Thank you. I, I have some concern about just adding the parking in um, R1 as a work plan item. I, I'm not necessarily opposed to it, but I think it's a bigger picture than that. And I think it would make more sense at some point for council to agendize exactly what we want and, and perhaps be sending them a, a bit of a more comprehensive direction rather than just looking at that one particular piece. So I, I'd be a little hesitant in sending that back at this point. Okay, that's fine. I mean, I, I do know that I, the motion is to put it under potential items, not items, so it would have to come back to us before any work was done. But I would like to give them better direction, I think is, is kind of what I'm saying. As Mayor Jordan, you want to clean your motion up? Um, well, I'm curious to hear from the other two council members. I'm, I'm fine with the direction the motion is going in. It, it's going to come back for us approval. So, any other council member has any concern? Go ahead, Council Member Nason. Yeah, I'd like to hear what um, Chair Wadi thinks and whether perhaps uh, because this does seem like a fairly substantial uh, change, whether perhaps the um, the Planning and Zoning Commission should have a chance to. Uh, uh, look look at these and come up with their own language for, uh, uh, for their own work plan. Thank you for that for the opportunity to, to chime in. Um, as it relates to the uh, off street parking minimum proposal, you know certainly the topic um, it's been very topical um, over many applications that we've had lately. Um, I think it's certainly that's something of interest. What I would say sort of from a pragmatic perspective, and you know, I, I do sit in a very similar seat for my day job in managing work plans for a current planning department. 
Um, there's only so much that can get done uh, in a certain amount of time. And we have a very, very full plate with the housing element and the San Pablo Avenue specific plan, as well as just reacting to the market here in Albany with um, current planning applications. We've had a multitude of joint, multiple hearings in a given day. Um, I'm not sure we can at this time take on other incredibly large substantive items, um, such as the off street parking, I think it would be a great thing to put sort of in the parking lot for no pun intended there of, of future topics. Um, but it may not be uh, timely to have it in this current work plan. Um, I think for the soft story, I would probably need to defer to um, Ann Hirsch a bit on this. Um, I, in my experience, it's not so much a planning and zoning issue soft story, it's more of a building code issue. Um, it's certainly not an expertise as a planner that I have to opine on. Um, so it may just not be the right um, body to have that part of our work plan. Um, I thought I would just chime in on the um, on the retrofit, the seismic ordinance. I know that uh, Jeff Bond, the community development director, and Michelle Plaus, uh, one of our um, sustainability planners, um, are working with a, a consultant on that process. Um, I'm not sure where it stands right now. I, I know they are working on something, um, but I think our last involvement with this particular topic in the planning commission was a study session that we had in 2019. So, um, you know, it it was looked at initially, um, but I think because of the nature of the work being so technical, it, it's kind of best left in the hands of, of the consultant um, for some preparation and, and kind of, you know, big picture um, examination of implementation. Thank you. Thank you, Councilmember Mason. Vice Mayor Jordan, you want to try your motion again or? Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, just in that regard, the only reason I thought to add it here was because it was in the previous work plan. So okay. if staff suggests that it doesn't make sense to have it in the work plan of this body, that's that's fine with me. But that was my my precedent for it. Um, if I can call out Councilmember Tiedem and he hasn't, I mean, well, first of all, the R1 parking item, again, it's it's in the parking lot. That's potential future items is the parking lot for items. So my desire is to have it there again, downsize again. The purpose of that section is not to say you will work on this or the, the particular body will work on this, but simply to track it so that it's everybody's reminded that that's something that we want to think about doing at some point in time in the future. Um, Councilman so, Ratita, have any, any you want to say? Oh, sure. I, I think having parking in the parking lot of uh, potential future items makes a lot of sense, seeing as I suspect that tonight when talking about the, the housing development on our agenda, we're going to spend a fair amount of time talking about parking. Um, so it makes a lot of sense to have it on our radar for something that we're going to do. Um, and as for the software retrofit, if it makes sense to keep that at the staff level right now, then no need to have it here. Thank you so much. All right, Vice Mayor Jordan, let's go ahead and get a motion. I will try again. Um, so I move approval of the plan, uh, work plan as presented with the addition of noting that um, consideration of measure K and measure K modification is part of the housing element and placing uh, consideration of parking policy in the R1 zone into the potential work items and adding processing of planning applications into the recurring action items section. Seconded. All right, and let's go ahead and get a roll call, please. Vice Mayor, Vice Mayor Jordan. Yes. Council Member McQuay. Yes. Council Member Nason. Yes. Mayor Gary. Yes. Council Member Tiedemann. Yes. Motion carries. All right, thank you so much, Liz and Anne, for your time tonight. We'll go ahead and move to line item A2, which is an update on the eucalyptus on Albany Hill. We'll ask for a staff report uh, at this time. Please uh, bear with me for a one minute.
Good evening. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. I'm Margot Cunningham, Natural Areas Coordinator. I'll share my screen now. All right, thank you. Okay. We are here to talk to you about eucalyptus on Albany Hill. The last time we updated you on the eucalyptus was in June. And at that time, we informed you about tree surveys by a consulting arborist and a pathogen study by a UC Berkeley lab. Since then, we have received results and recommendations from those studies, and we will provide a summary of those tonight. More details are in the staff report and both the arborist report and the pathogens report are in the agenda packet. In addition, the consulting arborist is at this meeting and will give more details about their report and can answer questions about it as well. Tonight, we are asking that the council adopt the enclosed resolution 2021-105, authorizing establishment of the Albany Hill Eucalyptus Capital Improvement Project and appropriate $100,000 from remaining Measure R capital funds for the project. So our agenda tonight, I'll give a recap of what has been done, what we have told you. I'll give a summary of studies that have been finished to date. Uh, Short-term mitigations, I'll hand over to our fire chief long-term project plan, other studies, private parcels, a tentative timeline, initial funding, and then I'd like to have our arborist give more details about their report, and then we'll take questions. So recap. Last fall, staff noticed trees on Albany Hill turning brown. In May, we gave a presentation to the Parks Commission about a pathogen study being conducted by a UC Berkeley research lab. The city hired a consulting arborist to conduct surveys of eucalyptus along roads and paths. And we updated city council in June. I want to emphasize that work on the issues concerning the eucalyptus has been a joint effort between different departments in the city, public works, the fire department, community development, as well as consultants and investigators. The photo here gives you an idea of the condition of the trees right now. This is the trail that goes from Taft down to Jackson and leaves have turned brown and dropped. Branches have fallen and you'll see along the trunks of the trees, leaves are sprouting from dormant buds. These trees are suffering. At the suggestion of a plant pathologist from the Pacific Southwest Research Station of the US Forest Service here in Albany, a Cal Fire forest health specialist conducted water stress readings on eucalyptus leaf stems in June and August. The readings revealed that five of the six eucalyptus trees sampled on the crest of the hill and lower down along Jackson Street on the east side of the hill were highly stressed. One tree lower down slope was mildly stressed. Because of drought conditions, less water is available to the trees and the demand for water by the trees is greater. We did not receive the Cal Fire Scientist report in time to include in the City Council packet, but we will include it in our next update to City Council or the Parks Commission. The Arborist report, this was initiated by the city they assessed 390 trees along paths and roads, 
They found that most are in poor or fair health and have poor structure. Their recommendations were to remove some that pose an immediate danger to public safety. And I will talk about these in slide six. Remove most of the rest. Conduct a higher level assessment for trees in monarch habitat. And then consider, the city should consider stand dynamics. And I will let the arborist elaborate on that later in the presentation. Back to the higher level assessment, we do plan to meet with another arborist about conducting this higher level assessment in June. I'm sorry, in December. So here's a map showing where the arborist assessed trees. So all along Jackson, the slope above, above Jackson Street on the east side of the hill, along Taft, the trail between Taft and Jackson, and then along the crest, both along the concrete ADA pathway and the fire road along the crest. In September, we had a tree company remove 14 dead or dying trees along the crest and they pruned one. Here you'll see three that were cut near the Taft turnaround. The stumps are here, here, and here. And you'll see that one was mostly rotted inside. The eucalyptus dieback report. This is the pathogens report. It was initiated by other agencies, San Francisco PUC, the Pacific Southwest Research Station of the US Forest Service and East Bay Regional Parks. The investigation was conducted by a UC Berkeley plant pathology lab headed by Matteo Garbalato. And the lab sampled eucalyptus from six sites around the Bay Area, including Albany Hill. Common symptoms were brown foliage and that's leaves, brown leaves and twig cankers. And the results are that a leaf blight fungus was found at all sites. This fungus is actually found in eucalyptus species worldwide and is harmless until the tree becomes physiologically stressed. The study concluded that the dieback of eucalyptus is strongly driven by two main factors, environmental stress, that is drought, increasing temperatures, decreasing fog. And then the other factor is pathogens taking advantage of the compromised health of the trees. The authors and funders of the study are still working on formal best management practices. But preliminary recommendations in the report are Eliminate eucalyptus in drier sites because they are not adapted to the recent warming and drying climate. If stands or trees are to be maintained, thin the weakest and remove from the site leaves, twigs and branches, which contain most of the pathogen load. Alternatively, leave the debris on site and spread soil on top or compost the debris on site. Specific to Albany Hill, which is an overwintering site for monarchs, the investigator recommended cleaning up the site as much as possible after tree removal and planting a variety of trees that are drought tolerant. And the photo here, this shows what the leaves look like. They have these spots, brown spots all over them. And you could see that in all the trees on Albany Hill. Okay, our short-term plan, I wanna turn this over to our fire chief to talk about what we're doing in the short-term about this issue. 
Thank you, Margo. Good evening, Madam Mayor and Council Members. Uh, the fire department has uh, continued to do our daily hill checks. Uh, it's been a valuable tool for us to be able to uh, see the progress that's been made uh, throughout the, the, the year with the fire uh, uh, related vegetation management activities. It's also allowed us to see if there's any, uh, any folks that have um, uh, built or created an encampment on the hill, which generally increases the fire danger because of warming and cooking fires. Uh, we've been able to identify some hazard trees that uh, we helped to fall uh, because they were uh, just barely, they were hanging up there precariously and could have fell and hurt somebody. Some of the other items that we're doing is uh, we're getting close to having the hydrant uh, installed at the very top of Taft. It's in the workflow and hopefully should be done within the next, the next month to five weeks by East Bay Mud. We've done dr uh, drills with the neighboring departments to have them familiar with our hill so that they know what the terrain's like and where their vehicles can or cannot go. Uh, so we can have a quicker response uh, to fires on, on different parts of the hill. Uh, we have uh, met with the property owners of the HOA uh, and by, by property owners, I mean their representatives, so their property management uh, folks. And it was encouraging to see that they're uh, enthusiastic about uh, helping to uh, take care of, of the vegetation and the dead and dying type uh, trees on their property. Uh, like, like us, they're worried about the cost. They're very interested in doing whatever we can collaboratively with the, with the partnership. Uh, and to that end, I've made contact with our uh, battalion, one of our battalion chiefs in the Cal Fire Ranger Unit, the S SCU Ranger Unit. Uh, I'm going to be meeting with him Wednesday to find out what types of programs we might be able to utilize from the state with their uh, uh, hand crews to do uh, mitigation type work on the hill at little to no cost. And finally, uh, the continued uh, vegetation management that we're doing with urban, urban tilth, uh, any hazard trees that we're able to fall, we're, we're handling. Um, and uh, otherwise we have uh, Public Works as other uh, partners. Uh, so that, that's, that's pretty much what we've been doing for the short-term mitigation. Uh, we're waiting to see what develops from some uh, bills that were passed uh, recently by Governor Newsom related to wildland fire uh, safety and vegetation management and such. So uh, hopefully we'll find out about programs and monies that will be available uh, for this exact type of program. And I just want to echo that it's been a uh, it's been a great collaborative effort between uh, the departments, uh, the public works, ourselves, uh, community development. Uh, PD has also been patrolling uh, the hill as well uh, for an added uh, added presence, uh, being able to answer questions and uh, pretty try to keep people. Uh, calm about the situation with the uh, the trees and the potential for uh, fire hazard. Thank you. Thank you, Fire Chief. Okay, so our long term plan. All of the information and recommendations from the scientific studies that we've been doing will guide us in putting together a plan for a large scale removal of eucalyptus, erosion mitigation, and subsequent habitat restoration. We are putting together a request for proposals to submit to forestry and biology professionals to help us prepare and implement this plan, which we want to include do we want to do phase removals or removal all at once? We want to protect the and restore the existing native plant communities, including the coast live oaks growing in the understory of the eucalyptus. We want to protect and restore monarch habitat. Vegetation communities that have a lower fire hazard are important as is soil stabilization and erosion prevention. We do have some other studies, the fuel assessment and expanded monarch habitat analysis. These are both underway and we will report back when we have results and recommendations from those studies. 
private parcels, it's very important that we collaborate with everybody, all the landowners on the Hill. The studies presented tonight and in the staff report focus on eucalyptus trees located on city owned property. Staff understands that the concerns identified in these studies also exist in trees located on the privately owned parcels of the Hill. While the approach for engaging the owners of the private parcels has not been fully developed, staff anticipates continuing the collaborative approach to working with those owners that we have established during the annual maintenance and mitigation work. At a minimum, staff will support development of plans for individual parcels by sharing information developed from the fuel load study and our other scientific studies. Staff will also investigate funding opportunities for removal of trees and restoration on private parcels as well as city owned parcels. So here's a tentative timeline. Develop a capital project plan, scope of work, come up with a team of consultants about six to 12 months, CEQA about three to six months, design a final plan and obtain contractors about three to six months, execute the plan about six to 12 months. And we are researching grants and will continue with that process all during this timeline. And we will update the Parks, Recreation and Open Space Commission as well as City Council periodically during this timeline. And this is the initial funding that we are asking for, a higher level tree safety assessment, development of a plan for tree removal and habitat restoration, CEQA, contingency, which gives us more flexibility in case we need to gather more information or get more assistance from our consultants. And to, re to reiterate, staff is asking that the council adopt the enclosed resolution authorizing establishment of the Albany Hill Eucalyptus Capital Improvement Project and appropriate $100,000 from remaining Measure R capital funds for the project. And at this point, I wanna bring in our tree consultant to give some more details about the Arborist report. So if we could get um, Molly Batchelder, I believe she's in the audience. Yes, hello. Hi, Molly. Hi. Thanks, Margo, for the presentation. Um, yes, yeah, so good evening, evening everyone. Um, I guess I'll just describe a little bit of our procedure. My father and I were directed to uh, survey all trees that were in, um, had a target area, so either a path, a street, or a residence. And we, um, did a level one assessment where we did a, a visual health inspection. We had a, a rubber mallet, so we um, hit the tree, hit the trunks for signs of hollowness and um, kind of looked around the root system a bit. Um, the criteria that we used uh, to recommend trees for removal, uh, if the top was dead, uh, that means uh, that the tree, um, was we call it in a state of strain. So it's, it's beginning to decline and really no, no amount of um, cultural care could bring that tree back once it's in a state of strain. Um, if there were stump sprouts, a lot, a lot of the trees were previously cut down and eucalyptus globulus do tend to sprout up from the base, um, but the, the old stump is decayed. And so it doesn't have a very uh, stable um, um, footing. 
um, internal decay. A lot of the trees had fat fire scar scars. There's been a lot of fire uh, fires moving through that area. And one of the trees that we actually uh, felled for the researchers for the UC Berkeley had a fire scar and was very decayed inside. And as Margot pointed out in a presentation, one of the trees that they took down also uh, were, um, were pretty hollow. So, um, so if we said if there's any trees that do have fire scars that we would want to look at to try to preserve, um, they, knew they need that level three assessment um, to really figure out how um, advanced that internal decay is. Um, and finally, if any trees had any root stability concerns, there are a lot of trees on the slope and that's kind of a um, crumbly uh, sandstone slope. There's in our reports, we did find, a, um, put, we put um, some photos in of trees that had already fallen um, that just lost their stability um, and came down on that slope. So, um, and then finally, um, so that was about um, 319, I believe, trees that were recommended for removal based on those, those five, four criteria. Um, stand dynamics is a situation where if you remove a bunch of trees um, and you leave some other trees that may not have fit into that criteria for removal, you open those trees up to greater wind forces and sun forces. And so um, the trees have not e like um, evolved to handle those types of wind forces. So oftentimes uh, they, do, um, they do fall down in, um, in wind and, and um, uh, storm events. So um, that's about it. I guess, uh, you know, maybe it would be best if we just have some um, some questions and I know um, what your concerns are and I can address them. Thank you, Molly. Yeah, my pleasure, Margo. So yeah, we'll take questions at this point. All right, thank you, Marco. I'll go ahead and open it up for council to start off with questions. Go ahead, Vice Mayor Jordan. Thank you, Mayor. I just wanted to either confirm or deny my understanding from, I think it was last spring, that the fuel load assessment is for both the city property and the private open spaces. That's correct. That's, okay, yes. great. So that's that's coming to us. Yep. And uh, I, I was quite interested in <laughs> about the fire scars. Um, this is really trippy, so not worth spending a lot of time on, but when was there a fire of that magnitude up there? Right? To my knowledge, it hasn't been in at least 26 years that I've been here, or 27 years I've been here. Where is the fire? Um, you know, evidence has show that there were plenty of fires that moved through. Um, you know, those trees have probably been around for like, I don't know, 100 plus years. Uh, so um, so what, what happens is that there's debris that builds up against the base of the tree. And as the fire moves through, uh, that debris uh, catches on fire and smolders. Uh, so a lot of times um, one side of um, the trees in, in a stand all had fire scars um, because of, of that situation. Thank you. Awesome, Member Nason. Yeah, um, I'm, I'm curious whether uh, this is, this planning effort will um, uh, involve any changes to our, is it designed to be consistent with the master plan or is this an opportunity to revisit some of the um, uh, policies in the master plan that may be somewhat different from what we would consider today, given what we know about fire and climate change and uh, a variety of factors that uh, affect this. Well, it, it's consistent with the master plan in that the master plan did call for gradually uh, removing the eucalyptus on the crest. And this is maybe not gonna be gradual, so gradual since they're all suffering and need to come out sooner than later. But yeah, I think it, at some point we do need to update the master plan because things have changed as you say, climate change and, and the eucalyptus are, are uh, probably not going to be on the hill as much as they used to be except where the monarchs, the monarch habitat is. And that's another element that, that should go into 
uh, any future master plan. Is this an opportunity to change any of the policies or is that beyond the scope of the secret I analysis? Think that's beyond the scope that that would involve a whole nother uh, public process to go through and we don't, this is kind of a more, I don't wanna say emergency, but it's a more urgent process that we need to go through at this point. Um, so to, to kind of trip it up with, with redoing the master plan, I, I don't think that's what we wanna do right now. Thank you. I have a quick question, Margo, on this regarding the funding. So as I see the estimated costs listed here, I mean, I guess I'm just a little concerned where did these numbers come from, how you were able to measure them, and then if you can provide, are there any type of backup plans, you know, if, if you know, God forbid something happened tonight or later this week, what is the immediate backup plan to, um, you know, contain if any outbreak of fire again? Well, that, that was what uh, our fire chief addressed, our short-term plan is we are checking the hill daily. And if we see, we also want to have the arborist check trees periodically as well. If we see hazards that need to be taken care of right away, um, we will find a way. We'll either hire a company or have the fire department or our vegetation management contractor deal with the, the hazards. Um, in terms of the, the funding levels, these are estimates at this point. Um, my best, our best estimates um, for initial funding. If, if it turns out that we need to come, we need more funding, we'll have to come back to council at some point in the future. And, 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 and I understand that they're estimates, but how are you able to measure them? Like, was it based on, you know, finding out, you know, X, Y, Z? Costs. Yeah, yeah. The, the higher level tree assessment, I talked with a the ar the other arborist about that and he gave me estimates of how much it would cost for um, doing studies, doing these higher level studies on certain on per tree, how much it would cost per tree and about how many trees um, that we would do it on. So I that's how I came up with that and then I padded that some. Uh, the habitat restoration plan is an estimate based on other plans that we've had done in the past, similar kinds of plans. The CEQA, I'm a little bit not too sure about that. And that's why we have a, a large contingency amount in there. Okay. Councilman McClay. Thank you. I have several questions. Um, <clears throat> Margo, you mentioned that we received the CAL FIRE report, but not in enough time to get it on this agenda. Is it possible for you to summarize it briefly? And I guess my main question is, does it change anything? Is there anything in there that would change what we do going forward? The, the CAL FIRE water stress readings report? I, yeah. Whatever you mentioned earlier that yeah. we had... Yeah, I did summarize it. Um, here, let me find it again. Yeah, he was a, he's a Cal Fire forest health specialist. And he took what's called water stress readings on six eucalyptus. So to find out what kind of state these the trees are in. And he found that they were almost all of them were highly stressed, meaning they're not getting enough water and there isn't that much water available to them to get. Um, yeah, and we'll, when we get, I do have that report now, I just, I didn't get it in time for the deadline for the city council packet. So we will include that in the next, our next update to you. Okay, thank you. Um, and as, as trees are removed, is the debris around that's left, is that all cleaned up so that we're not leaving um, debris around that's certainly a fire hazard? Is that all kind of being? Yeah, taken? that's something that we will have to discuss. It, it's going to depend on uh, a lot of things. Cost is one, one factor. The 
the plant pathologist said it's best to remove the, the leaf and branch and twig debris to, to um, uh, if you're gonna have, keep having some eucalyptus in the area, which we may because uh, we may plant some more, maybe not, hopefully not the blue gum eucalyptus, <laughs> but different kinds of eucalyptus for the monarchs. But yeah, they'll, that's something that, that we're gonna have to flesh out later. And it's also, we're waiting to get more formal best management practices from the plant pathologists to help us, to guide us in this. Okay, thank you. Um, and I think my, my last question is about the um, private property owners. <clears throat> I'm encouraged to hear that they're enthusiastic about working with us and uh, wanna to, want to take care of their property. But I do have concerns that they, they really need to understand that they have to do this. It's not optional. And while we're trying to work with them, and it seems like we're paying for a lot of searching for grants and things like that, that they, they're going to need to pay their fair share. And, and we need to keep stressing that to them, that it is their responsibility. And while we'll help them, they, they need to take care of their own property. And I, I, I really want to, and I see that Mark's nodding his head, but I just, I really want this to not end up that all of it on our plate. Yes, well, I think they are getting it now. Um, some of them, I think they didn't even know that this property was theirs. They thought it belonged to the city in, in some cases. Um, but I, we have been working with them, uh, the fire department and public works. We have reached out to um, the HOAs and they actually, the five through five Pierce, they have done some initial fire reduction work 50 feet east of their fence line in the private open space. And the 555 Pierce folks are, um, they've been getting uh, bids for work to do 50 feet from their fence line as well. And the 545 folks, I think they've already, it, when I checked it, it looked like they had done some work 50 feet behind their fence line. So I think it is, it's gonna be a positive thing. I think we're all working together on this and we'll be sharing information and so. Is there any single family homes that own any property that goes up toward, into the hill? Are any of them involved in, in this? That would probably be the ones bordering on the east side below Jackson, which that area isn't quite, it isn't as much of a fire hazard in terms of uh, there aren't eucalyptus there, but that is something that we can look into as well. What about any houses on Pierce Street on the east side of Pierce, south of the condos? Do any of those property lines go far enough back to be impacted? Um, let's see, you're talking about the south end of Albany Hill? Right. Basically, so like the, end of, the end of Hillside and um, Gateview, that area? That area and, and Pier Street. There's, you know, there's a whole lot of houses on Pier Street I'm just wondering if, if, if any of them are impacted. Pierce Street, there's, all I can think of are the condos. There's the, the, the 11 acre property, they do, they, every year they do fire work. Right. 30 South, feet on their boundaries. So it actually looks pretty good there. Good, okay. Uh, the area that Councilmember McQuaid is asking about is south of the 11 acres, which entails uh, single residences on lots for Pierce Gate View and Hillside. But I think those yards, just from my walking around, seem pretty domesticated, if you will. But I don't know if the drum survey is going to cover those as well. No, because that's not that's not open space. Those are. See, this is this is 
open space on Albany Hill on city property and the private open spaces. We're, we're not dealing with people's backyards over there. Sounds good. Okay, thank you. All right, I'll go ahead and check the participants to see if there's any questions. And it uh, looks like we have two hands raised up, so we'll go ahead and two minutes in. Uh, good evening. I'm glad uh, we finally got around to talking about the monarch butterflies because um, that was one of the really important issues as well as a fire hazard. Um, monarch butterflies, you know, I don't know if they're endangered species, but they sure are beautiful. That's for sure. Um, so the last thing I want to say, actually, I think this is my own only venue. Um, there's, a, there's a few boulders. I'm sorry, there's a few boulders right at the entrance on the top there up at the circle. And I was just saying if the fire department or if the city could secure those boulders somehow, uh, because those could potentially roll down the hill and roll right into uh, Pier Street condos. So I was just hoping that those uh, boulders can be secured uh, somehow a lot better. Thank you. My understanding is those boulders, when they were put in, they were half buried into the ground. Go ahead, Nick. Okay, thank you, uh, Mayor and Council Members. Um, I believe I heard that uh, should it be the case that some eucalyptus are uh, removed, that a recommendation was that other trees be planted. And I'm curious, if this is a, uh, because of the monarch butterflies, because of accommodation of the monarch butterflies uh, in the hope that they would use the other trees um, instead of, as well as the eucalyptus, or if that was simply because there's trees there and we uh, want to always have trees. In which case, I'm wondering if that is an actual policy decision that if eucalyptus are removed, we always want to have some tree some trees on Albany Hill. I think, I think it, uh, I'm not sure that is a policy point um, and it should be discussed by uh, Parks and Rec and Open Space and the council. Uh, but I would like to know if the reason for the replacement trees, thank you. Yes, the trees, so the replacement trees are to replace the trees in the monarch habitat, the ones that we would have, if we have to remove ones there that uh, a lot of them are dead and dying and we need to replace them so that monarchs will have areas that they can come and cluster to. Um, there are a lot of coast live oaks in the understory and toyons and once eucalyptus are removed, they will grow out. And they're actually good middle story trees for monarchs. They, they do use the coast live oaks. They don't cluster in them the same way that they do in, in the eucalyptus and taller trees, but they do use them for resting as well as the toy on. The Albany Hill master plan, it does call for preserving and enhancing native plant communities on the hill. So that is something that we're we are that will be an important part of our long term project plan is to encourage those native trees and other native plants that are there. And then supplement the trees that we take out in the monarch area with new trees that they can use for their clustering. Go ahead, Clay. Yeah, I actually had a question and a comment. <clears throat> I walk I walk up on Albany Hill basically daily. Um, I notice a, a number of trees now have either little red flags or, or little green flags. I was curious what exactly that meant. I can kind of guess what the red flag means. Um, <clears throat> and, and the other thing, though, I wanted the comment I wanted to make is, is a while back, 10, 15 years ago, there was the great eucalyptus debate. I, I know the uh, UC Berkeley suggested clear-cutting uh, many trees 
in and around their, their, their properties. And it, there was a lot of pushback and it was, it ultimately didn't happen, at least not to the extent that Berkeley had proposed. It sounds like we've weighed in on one side of that debate. I, I don't know if the debate, I actually, this is the first I've heard of this project. Um, I don't know if the debate's now settled or if there's still some concerns. I, it, there certainly are bigger eucalyptus groves around the Bay Area that must be suffering, that must be experiencing the same kind of problem we think we're experiencing here. I wish I knew a little more about this and I would urge the council to kind of go slowly if, unless, unless this is a really, a, a decision to, to remove lots of trees is really a settled decision. All right, thanks. Yes. Well, the problem is that the trees are dying or in a lot of cases dead. So it's kind of been decided for us, you might say. Um, I don't think we need to keep a whole lot of dead or dying trees on the hill. We need to, to it, it's a public safety concern. It's a fire safety concern. Okay, it looks like we don't have any more comments from the public. I'll go ahead and bring it back to the council for additional questioning. Go ahead, Vice Mayor Jordan. Uh, I was just going to make a motion at the appropriate time. Okay, yeah. are there any other questions? Remember, Nathan, I saw your mic's off. Uh, I, I'd like to make a comment. Um, okay. I, uh, I support this uh, very strongly. Um, I, I hear what uh, Mr. Larson and I'm sure many others um, will have concerns about seeing trees removed, but um, I think that, uh, in our present situation, uh, the action is, is pretty clearly warranted and um, this has been an issue of discussion around the East Bay for many, many years now. And the, the science I think is, is fairly clear. We do have a policy of retaining um, eucalyptus for uh, quality of life concerns basically. And I think the, the language is about um, history and enjoyment of the hill that, that for many people, the the eucalyptus are almost a symbol of, of the hill. But I, and we affirmed that, that was back in like 91 and we, uh, we not us, but you know, our predecessor council affirmed that uh, in, in 2012. I think that the time is coming when, when we really need to revisit that. And uh, if um, in light of climate change in light of the asto what this astonishing situation with wildfire uh, that is, is really imperative and with the homeless situation that we have people going up and uh, lighting fires um, in, the, in the forest. Uh, we need to take consideration of all that. We also had the discussion with the Ohlone people. I think that it's important that we going forward that we take into consideration um, some of the cultural values that may be, you know, beyond uh, Albany and its immediate history. Uh, this is a forest that, that dates to the late 19th century. So it has, has history here, um, but there's a lot of other considerations that um, were probably not as well uh, attended to 10 years ago and certainly not 30 years ago. So I wanna support this. I want to um, look for opportunities to reevaluate uh, some of the policies, a number of the policies that we adopted um, in 2012 and bring them up to date given what we know today. Thank you. Councilmember McQuay, thank you, Councilmember Nason. Thank you. Um, I would certainly agree with what, what Council Member Nason said. I, I do have concerns and have for a long time about the fire danger on the Hill. And I hope that we can move quickly and, and prudently to resolve it with, 
with appropriate concern for the for the monarch butterflies and and the other critters that live on the hill. Um, and I think it's important uh, to remember that while these trees have been there over a hundred years, or at least were planted over a hundred years ago, they're not native trees. They're they're not the you know, when you look at the old, old, old photographs of Albany Hill, it was grassland. And so I think we need to keep that in mind as we, as we move this forward. So yes, I think we should move forward. Um, yeah, largely to echo points that have already been made. I just wanted to say that I think this is a uh, pretty exemplary work from staff. Uh, you know, this has been going on the back burner and we haven't heard about it in a little while and we've had people come and ask when we're going to hear about it in meetings. Um, so I think people have been looking forward to this and I think it was worth the wait because there was a lot of work to do and it's obvious that it's been being done. Uh, and it's also pretty clear that for the benefit we're going to get spending the amount of money that's projected over the course of a couple of years uh, to uh, change things seems pretty worth it to me. Um, and I, for one, wouldn't really mourn the passing of any eucalyptus trees on the hill. Uh, so I think this is a, a good plan. All right, Vice Mayor, you want to go ahead and make your motion? Um, yeah, but, uh, just to just to emphasize, my understanding is <clears throat> this funding is only for planning um, and perhaps some emergency removals, but it's really for planning. So uh, I think there is some implication of decision and direction, but it's not the ultimate decision because that's going to cost probably a lot more. Um, and so with that, I will move uh, passage of resolution number 2021-105. Seconded. Second. All right, let's go ahead and get a roll call, please. Mayor Gary. Yes. Vice Mayor Jordan. Yes. Council Member McQuay. Yes. Council Member Nason. Yes. Council Member Tiedemann. Yes. Motion carries. Thank you so much, and um, interim tree Jim. Thank you for your presentation, and we look forward to hearing from you soon. Have a good evening. All right. With that said, we're going to go ahead and move on to the public hearing. Line out of nine. One. We'll go ahead and hear from staff at this time. Good evening again, Honorable Mayor and City Council members. Um, before you tonight is um, a new mixed use project at 540 San Pablo Avenue. Uh, all of you know that as the, the Albany Bowl. Um, and this is a project uh, that we've been working on with the Planning Commission and the applicant over the course of the past year. And we're pleased to bring it to you this evening. Um, I'm going to go ahead and uh, share my screen. So for your review this evening, I'm gonna provide you with a uh, just an overview staff presentation summarizing the staff report. Uh, the applicant is also in attendance to provide you with a, a presentation and answer questions that you might have. Uh, we would then recommend you hold public comment. Um, once that concludes, bring it back to the council for discussion. Uh, and in your packet this evening, we've included uh, two resolutions. The first resolution is to uh, determine that the project is exempt from CEQA. And the second resolution um, is a, a recommends um, approving design review density bonus and the street tree removal associated with this project. So just to give you an overview, um, the project is subject to design review. And what that means, um, both for the, the commission review that occurred prior and your review tonight, um, you're looking at very general standards of review. So the general plan conformance, site planning, access, arch architecture, landscape design, coordination of design details, and privacy. Uh, as it relates to um, state density bonus law, just to refresh your memory, um, state density bonus law is a tool that is available for housing developers um, that uh, wish to build additional dwelling units uh, in order to obtain flexibility from uh, some of the local requirements. And in exchange, they're required to uh, build affordable housing as part of their project. 
And I wanted to just remind the council that what that means is that um, there is a deviation and relief from our local requirements, which can include the zoning code and general plan. Um, if in looking at the public comments, as well as the prior commission review, there was some uh, concern expressed about consistency with the general plan. However, the state density bonus law uh, is a mechanism by which a developer can seek relief um, from, from those local policies in exchange for providing affordable housing. This application is also subject to SB 330, which was a housing bill that passed uh, two years ago. And what that effectively does is limit the project review um, to five meetings. It also locks in the development standards from the date of initial filing. So uh, the meeting scheduled for this evening is meeting four. Um, uh, the prior two meetings included planning commission review in August and September, and then the parks rec and open space commission for street tree removal also in September. Just to give you some background, uh, the site is uh, particularly large by Albany standards. It's 2.18 acres, uh, currently has the Albany Bowl, which of course um, closed at the end of 2020 uh, due to COVID-19. There are also some miscellaneous retail shells um, on the property. The subject site is zoned San Pablo Commercial, which does allow for mixed use development by right. Uh, there is an overlay zone of planned residential commercial and the site um, is within a half a mile of the El Cerrito BART station and um, there's also an AC transit stop immediately in front of the, the bowling alley building. And here's a, a snapshot of the, the zoning map uh, for your reference. And then again, um, this is a snapshot of the property. Currently, it's comprised of nine separate parcels, which have been assembled by the property owner over time. As part of this scope, there is a lot line adjustment that will consolidate uh, all nine parcels into one contiguous 2.18 acre parcel, and that will encompass the entirety of the project. And here's a street view of the property uh, facing west um, at Brighton and San Pablo. And to give you just, a, again, a snapshot of the residential details, um, buildings A and B um, will have the majority of the units. Building A is proposed to be five and six stories in height with a maximum height of 69 feet and will contain 121 units. Building B is proposed to be six stories, 71 feet in height with 77 units. So between those buildings, there are a total of 198 residential units. And on the Adams Street side, there are nine uh, townhomes that will front the street and integrate in um, to the neighborhood. Those townhomes are proposed to be 28 feet in height. And of the entirety of that scope, um, 21 units are proposed um, to be designated at a very low income occupancy status. And here is uh, just a snapshot of the unit mix. Um, it's, as you can see, there will be studio, loft, uh, one bedroom, two bedroom, and three bedroom units. Um, and one thing to note just on the three bedroom units, nine of the town, the townhouses that are proposed will have three bedrooms. There are also three bedroom apartment units proposed in um, building B. And here's a, a rendering um, similar to that street view I showed you earlier uh, facing west. Um, this is building A. Um, and building B is uh, here on the right side of the screen. And this is the uh, driveway, which will be preserved and uh, allow access to the property. And here is the, the townhouse view um, from the Adams Street side. Uh, there is a, a privately owned, publicly accessible mini park that is also proposed um, as part of this project. And just to give you a snapshot of the commercial um, uh, component of this project. Um, right now, it is proposed to be 5,750 square feet in three separate commercial shells, all located on the ground floor. Um, tenants are to be determined. Um, there will be some basic build out on the part of the builder um, that will include ADA restrooms for those shells. Um, and because they're, the tenants are to be determined, um, they will be responsible for their business specific improvements when, when the time comes. And here, uh, again, is a snapshot just to give you an idea of um, the, the ground floor um, spaces uh, in context with the upper level um, apartment units. And this is a, a view facing north. Um, so this right here is Clay Street and this is San Pablo looking north. And here's an overview of the site plan. Um, one thing to share with the council is that there is a shared easement between uh, the subject property and Sutter Health. Um, as part of this project, that easement is going to be uh, relocated in. 
Um, so there still will uh, be reciprocal access that is maintained uh, through the courtyard space to take um, great access to the signalized intersection. Um, this is the, the park that uh, was shown earlier in the rendering. Um, and on either side of this courtyard space, there are public access easements that can be used um, by anyone um, attempting to come to the site, be it by bike or by foot. Uh, there are two changes to note um, from the commission review a couple weeks ago to the council review tonight um, that did change the uh, project plans. Um, the first of which is a park expansion um, for that Adam Street Park. The commission recommended the elimination of six parking spaces, which the applicant complied with, um, and that increased that overall park area by just over 1,200 square feet. Um, so that footprint has gotten slightly larger. Uh, similarly, there was concern expressed about bike room access, and the applicant has modified uh, access to these bike rooms, which are currently through the garage. Um, there will be uh, an expanded landing area for uh, easier maneuverability into those rooms. Um, so under state density bonus law, um, the uh, project site, we, we calculate that based on um, the, um, the basic um, district uh, unit per acre density, which is 63 units per acre. So that results in 138 units, which we identify as the base project. Um, the density bonus law changed on the first of this year and allows for a 50% increase um, in density, which for this project results in the 207 units. Uh, in exchange for that density increase, the applicant is proposing um, the 21 units on site, which is 15% of the base project, so the 138 units, um, which would go to uh, occupancy for very low income uh, qualified households. And when we talk about density bonus, there are really two key components, um, concessions and waivers. Um, and the concessions are uh, reductions in site development standards or a modification from uh, zoning code or architectural requirement. Um, there are other regulatory incentives which result in identifiable and actual cost, reduction, uh, uh, cost reductions. This uh, could include reduced parking requirements and setbacks. Um, and the number of concessions is determined by the affordability provided. So in this case, with 15 very low uh, income restricted units, the developer is eligible for three concessions. Um, and they are pursuing three concessions with this, the first of which is to reduce the open space requirement from 41,000. 400 square feet to 22,390 square feet. There's a code requirement um, for planned unit development, uh, which they are also seeking a uh, concession. Um, and then lastly, uh, they're seeking a concession to waive the ground floor commercial frontage requirement on San Pablo Avenue. Uh, the other uh, um, mechanism in density bonus that applies are waivers. Um, the city may not apply any development standard which would result in a physical preclusion um, of construction of the project. And so um, this allows the applicant to waive um, or reduce development standards that otherwise prevent the project from being physically built. So this is more in line with standard development requirements such as height and floor area ratio. And the number of waivers um, is unlimited. Um, in this case, they're applying for three uh, waivers, the first of which is to increase the FAR from 2.25 to 2.95. Of course, an increase in building height from our local requirement of 38 feet to 71 feet in height. And then uh, lastly, projecting beyond the daylight plane regulations for Adams Street. Um, as I've mentioned throughout this presentation, um, there are um, the uh, units restricted on site, the 21 very low income units. Um, it's a mix of studios, um, one loft unit, eight one bedroom units, eight two bedroom units, one three bedroom unit, and one of the townhomes. Uh, in your packet, there is an affordable housing agreement um, that has been drafted and prepared uh, for your action this evening. And as part of that, um, the applicant is required to provide a detailed exhibit identifying the units which are subject to the income restriction. And so uh, this exhibit shows that um, those units are spread throughout really the entirety um, of the project. They're uh, at different floors um, and in both, um, both buildings as well as in the townhouse component. And with respect to housing income and rents, um, I mentioned in a in earlier on, as it related to the PNZ work plan, that this uh, information is published through Alameda County. So, in your staff report and in the presentation, we've provided you um, with the most recent information. Um, so, there's the household size and then the uh, income 
limitation that comes with that. So this gives you a snapshot of, uh, you know, of, for example, a family of four would have to have the income qualified at no more than $68,500 per year. And then the corresponding rent is uh, detailed below based on the unit size. So you can see it varies um, depending on the unit size, um, anywhere from uh, you know $1,198 for a studio to uh, $1,781 for a three bedroom. And with respect to occupancy, uh, the project sponsor manages the full affordable unit process on other projects that they've developed in the region. Um, so this is not their first time not only pursuing affordable housing, but also managing it as well. Um, they provide housing availability listings um, with the stipulated income requirements. They then screen those applicants to make sure that uh, those folks are indeed income qualified and that their paperwork is in order. And then um, once that's determined, qualified candidates are run through a lottery using a randomizer computer program um, to determine who, who gets the uh, units. Um, moving to a slightly different aspect of this project, as I mentioned, there is street tree removal. And our third meeting of this project involved the Parks, Recreation and Open Space Commission who reviewed this on September 29th. Um, there are a total of 27 trees which are proposed to be removed. Um, and you can see right now there's a mix of about four different species. American sweet gums are on San Pablo and then there's uh, different species on Adams. And there's a total of uh, 10 trees which will be preserved and 33 trees which will be added um, and that will result uh, in a total of five new trees overall around the perimeter of the project site. So uh, this, this scope in fact um, enhances and increases the number of uh, trees around the subject property. And this uh, just gives you a snapshot of the um, landscape design and the street tree planting around the perimeter um, of, of the project site. Overall, um, this is a pretty significant project for the city and pretty significant um, private investment. Uh, just a snapshot of a few, few aspects. This, of course, creates new housing opportunities uh, in Albany. There are 198 units um, in both of those buildings, all of which are ADA accessible, and one townhouse will also uh, provide accessibility. As I mentioned, there are 21 very low income units. Um, so we're, we're getting some affordable housing out of this. Um, there's also the uh, aspect of the publicly accessible, privately maintained park. Uh, the applicant is voluntarily um, setting the buildings back on the Clay Street and San Pablo sides to create wider sidewalks where currently the building um, goes up to the property line, creating uh, rather narrow sidewalks. Um, the benefit of this is that it creates the opportunity for future bicycle infrastructure. I've, I've just mentioned the trees. Um, of course, there will be modern commercial spaces that will be tenant ready uh, when the time comes. With respect to green building, this project will be subject to the recently adopted um, Albany Green Building Ordinance that was approved um, and certified by the state earlier this year. Um, just a point of clarity, this is actually something that um, it, the um, compliance is evaluated as part of the building permit plan check process, so it follows with the date of submittal. Uh, just a couple of highlights, 20% uh, of the parking spaces are required to have chargers. Um, EV ready um, it will apply to the remainder of the vehicle parking spaces provided by the project. 12% uh, of commercial parking spaces are required to be designated for clean air vehicles. Um, and then, of course, low flow plumbing fixtures um, are required in the residential and commercial spaces. Um, one thing to note, um, you know, all electric uh, doesn't apply right now to this project because we don't have a, an ordinance in place. However, the applicant has stated throughout the process that they are, in fact, going to apply, uh, provide electric appliances within all of the residential units in order to promote more electricity usage overall with the project. Um, as I mentioned before, um, the building is being set back, which um, will create opportunities for enhanced sidewalk, um, uh, you know, sidewalk area. Um, one thing that we have talked about um, in, internally with staff is the possibility for bicycle infrastructure on the public right of way around the perimeter of the site, um, as it seems that this project will create a, a pretty significant opportunity for that. 
Um, but it's important to note that if that is pursued, it is going to be a city sponsored project through the capital improvements program. And that would be handled through the transportation commission on a separate track. Um, the applicant is willing to make a voluntary contribution as part of this project, um, but that again is, is an effort that would proceed separately and would be city sponsored. Um, with respect to bicycle parking, 282 um, bicycle parking facilities um, or bicycle parking spaces are proposed. This includes um, a protected room in building A as well as another in building B. The townhome units will each have four uh, bicycle parking spaces. Uh, double stacked racks and 37 cargo spaces are also proposed and there will be publicly accessible bike racks along San Pablo Avenue. With respect to vehicle parking, I wanted to give you a little bit of history of just how this project has evolved. Um, when it was initially submitted as a study session item uh, earlier this year, the project had 197 off-street parking spaces. And with each commission review, um, the number has been modified. And uh, that's in part because the commission expressed a desire to see less parking and more usable open space. Uh, so with each iteration, um, we have seen a decline in the parking, but also a, a, an increase in the um, open space that's provided as part of the project. So um, initially, when we had 197 parking spaces proposed, there was 13,977 square feet. Um, from August to September, that parking went down to 180 and then 178 parking spaces, but the open space stayed the same. And then with the most recent review, um, the planning commission requiring that elimination of six spaces has now resulted in 22,390 square feet of public open space and 172 parking spaces. And with respect to just the applied ratio of vehicle parking, our code currently requires one parking space per unit. This project is eligible through state density bonus law uh, at a ratio of 0.5 spaces per unit. The project sponsor is sort of splitting the difference um, and actually parking the project at 0.74 spaces per unit. The parking is going to be achieved through a mix of standard spaces and um, parking stackers. And the parking will also be unbundled. Um, and what that means is that uh, occupants um, will be charged a separate fee if they choose to have uh, parking included as part of their rent. Um, this provides the option for occupants who don't own a car. They're not charged for something that they're not using. And overall, this uh, provides 154 spaces for the residential component. Uh, with respect to the commercial vehicle parking, um, the developer is providing a total of 18 spaces where nine are required. And one thing I wanted to address, um, though it's not a specific part of this project, it has come up in the correspondence. And so I wanted to just, you know, for the council's benefit, put this information in the record. Um, as park permit parking has come up uh, throughout the course of um, this project review. And there are existing permit parking regulations in section 912 of the municipal code. Uh, however, in order to implement a permit parking program, there has to be data collection uh, deter to determine the vehicle occupancy. And if there is an issue that requires management, there's further analysis of uh, the cost benefit nature that's done um, to show um, you know, the costs associated with implementation and management of a long-term program. And then ultimately it's up to the city council um, to direct uh, implementation or in action on this. Um, you know, that's something that was looked at a few years ago um, as part of a separate grant that was um, prepared through ACTC at the time the council um, effectively tabled the matter. But I just wanted to provide as a refresher um, what permit parking um, you know, looks like in terms of its structure and remind the council that this is part of a broader um, implementation action for, for a future date. Um, other highlights of the project include um, the art and public places ordinance, which this project is subject to. Currently, we have a condition of approval. Um, the applicant may choose to pursue art on site or pay an in lieu fee. Um, we have that condition of approval in there for them to decide when the time is appropriate. Uh, with respect to life safety compliance, um, the project will provide elevator access, roof access, and fire sprinklers. Um, as staff, we meet with the, fi the fire department weekly, um, and so they are very much uh, involved and consulted on an ongoing manner um, with, with each iteration of these plans. So they're very much an a, a involved party in our, our ongoing review. 
And lastly, a C3 compliance, which is clean water compliance on um, this project is subject to those standards um, for uh, stormwater runoff treatment. Just one uh, big picture reminder, this project is subject to the Housing Accountability Act, um, which uh, requires that if the, the council um, were to substantially change the project, um, you know, you're, you're limited in what you can do. Um, also, if you were to deny the project, you would have to make findings um, based on the preponderance of evidence that identifies the specific adverse impacts related to public health and safety. You have received um, not only all the correspondence that was received during the planning commission review, but also correspondence that was received over the weekend and today, all of which has been posted to the council agenda. And with respect to CEQA, um, the project uh, is recommended to be categorically exempt pursuant to section 15332. Um, this project is a little bit different given the scope and scale. Um, we did work with our CEQA consultant um, to do a categorical exemption. And there is a, a rather lengthy um, uh, study that is included as an attachment to the resolution um, that includes uh, the consultant's determinations as well as supporting appendices uh, to support this determination. So there's, there's evidence in the record um, to support this, this conclusion. And, with, and uh, finally, um, as I mentioned before, we have two resolutions in your packet this evening, the first of which is um, the categorical exemption for CEQA, and the second approving resolution is to approve the scope of design review, density bonus, and street tree removal for the project. And at this time, I'm going to stop my screen share and um, turn it over to Isaiah Stackhouse from Trachtenberg Architects. Uh, to provide you with a presentation on the project scope. Thank you, and um, hold on one sec. What we're gonna do is gonna take a quick break to about 9.05 and we'll jump back on. Thank you. Thank <laughs> you. 
All right, thank you so much. It is 9.05, we'll go ahead and uh, continue with the presentation at this time. So at this time, um, we're gonna promote uh, the uh, Isaiah um, Stackhouse um, from Trachtenberg Architects to provide the council with a presentation. Good evening. Uh, can everyone hear me and see the screen? Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, we don't see the screen though. You, you don't see the screen? Okay. Okay. All right, we see it. Thank you. Okay. Go ahead, please. Okay. Uh, great. Um, well, thank you, Anne, for your presentation earlier. Um, good evening. It's nice to be here with you tonight. Uh, I'm Isaiah Stackhouse of Trachtenberg Architects, uh, here to show you our project at 540 uh, San Pablo Avenue. Uh, so it's a great location on the active San Pablo corridor, uh, walkable to groceries, uh, services, and BART. Um, and as Anne uh, noted, um, there is a, a, a current easement uh, that's relocatable uh, that allows cars from Sutter pass through the site and out to the traffic light in order to be able to make a safe left turn on San Pablo. Uh, so this easement is written into the property title and cannot be revoked, uh, but we do have the, the freedom and flexibility uh, to move it on the site. And so here is the original site plan that we re reviewed with the commission um, back in March 24th. Uh, at that time, we had the easement uh, along Adams um, coming here and creating uh, just two separate buildings. Uh, but the commission commented that they would really like to see uh, more open space and less outdoor surface parking, um, ground level open spaces for community use if possible, uh, perhaps a, a cafe adjacent to outdoor uh, seating, um, a connection um, through to Adams, um, a, a, perhaps a built edge along Adams instead of the surface lot. Uh, and more family units if possible, larger uh, three bedrooms and, and more two bedroom units. So here was the revised site plan that we reviewed at the second meeting uh, on August 4th. Uh, and at this point, um, two thirds of the surface parking had been removed and replaced with townhouses and uh, a, a smaller park uh, and two plazas up on uh, San Pablo Avenue. Um, uh, we also redesigned building B to have a cafe adjacent to the open space. Um, we added three uh, mid-block uh, public access connections between San Pablo and Adams. Um, and we created a, a built edge of townhouses uh, with porches uh, to front Adams rather than the surface parking lot. Uh, and finally, uh, we were able to make the project more family friendly. Uh, in addition to adding uh, the park, um, a family center on the ground floor. We also added uh, 22 three bedroom units and more two bedroom units for a total of 102 family units, which is 49% um, of the units in the project are family units. Uh, so here's a, a plan we reviewed at the third hearing on September 29th. Uh, it included the following updates uh, in response to earlier commission comments. Uh, so we redesigned the park to be much more family friendly. Uh, we we uh, refined the townhouses uh, to be uh, richer, uh, more varied palette. We added decorative screens and alternating balconies. Uh, we added windows uh, to the ground level of building A to add articulation and daylighting. Uh, we made uh, the bike room in, in building A much more convenient. Uh, you can get to it now either through the lobby or through the garage. Uh, and we added more bikes. Uh, we enlarged the bike rooms, uh, 14 more bikes and six more cargo bikes, added bike charging, 
Uh, and then on the San Pablo streetscape, uh, we enlarged the retail uh, and lobbies and, uh, and active use features. Um, at the, we added um, uh, feature box windows that display uh, photos and memorabilia at the bike runs. Uh, and we revised the facades to be 85% glazing. Uh, and finally, here is the current plan, uh, which we'll walk you through now. Um, so one enters building A through the lobby here. There's a, a leasing office. Uh, there's a family center mentioned earlier, a uh, fitness room, a uh, large uh, secure bike room, uh, and a corner commercial space on the corner of, of Clay and San Pablo. Uh, going over to, to building B, uh, is a cafe space that opens up onto sidewalk seating. Um, lobby B, uh, that's now been redesigned and enlarged. We've added a, a pet spa here, uh, a, a large bike room, and, uh, and then commercial space um, uh, facing San Pablo and North. Uh, so in, in response to commission comments, um, we did go ahead and eliminated six surface park parking spaces uh, in order to uh, enlarge the, the family-friendly park, uh, which again is um, uh, on private property, but is um, fully accessible uh, to the wider community and it is now over 3,000 square feet. Uh, we also uh, redesigned the bike room doors and the garage layouts in order to uh, provide generous clearances uh, for cargo bikes as well. Uh, we did also relocate uh, the building A trash room to be very convenient to the lobby. Uh, and then we redesigned building B uh, to have a more active streetscape elements, uh, including the, the new pet spa. Uh, note, uh, we've heard comments from the commission and the public, both for more and less parking. Um, so here's where we landed and why. Uh, so residential, um, we're, there are 154 spaces for 207 units. Uh, that's a ratio of 0.7 four spaces per unit. Um, that's more than the 0.5 spaces required by the code, uh, but we believe it, it's really needed uh, in the case of this project to support uh, the project that is 49% family units, which is uh, uh, far, far above uh, the normal amount of family units in a project. And then on the commercial side, um, we've got 18 spaces uh, in the outdoor uh, parking court here. Um, with a total of 5,750 square feet, um, that, it's a ratio of three spaces per thousand. And uh, we believe that this is necessary to attract uh, good retail tenants. And um, attacking, uh, attracting vibrant retail is important not only for the project, but we believe also uh, for the wider community. So from the original plan, uh, we reduced the surface parking by 74%. Uh, and added the, the parks, plaza, and townhouses. And we also increased bikes significantly. Uh, the bikes now uh, exceed the requirement by 33%, and we're providing uh, 37 cargo bikes where none are required. Um, the project has also increased the publicly accessible site amenities to 12,243 square feet. So there's a, the park on Adams, there's a cafe plaza, a fountain plaza, uh, we have a, a dog walk area along Adams. Uh, there are three pedestrian connections to Adams. Uh, the Clay Street widening, again, the, the current uh, Clay Street frontage has just a five foot sidewalk and then the property line and then a building edge. Uh, we're proposing to hold a new building eight feet back uh, from the property line in order to create a, a 13 foot wide sidewalk that allows for, um, for, for real street trees and, uh, and great landscaping. And then finally, we're also holding the building back along San Pablo uh, to widen the sidewalk there to make room for sidewalk seating and such. So here's a, a podium level plan uh, up at level two. Uh, to, uh, good slide to talk about the family friendly features. Again, um, 102 uh, two and three bedroom family units, 49% of the project, including the new row of townhouses. Uh, there's a family center down on the ground floor we talked about, uh, the family friendly park, um, uh, family friendly uh, bike parking with 37 cargo bikes. 
Uh, and also the project will have uh, 21 below market rate units and 10 of these below market units will be larger family units, uh, two and three bedrooms, uh, including a below market rate uh, townhouse unit. Uh, here is a level six plan. Uh, and we would note that um, while the uh, project now includes these larger two and three bedroom units and townhouses, and uh, it's still well below the allowable uh, density bonus square footage. So uh, allowable with a 50% bonus is FAR of 3.375, uh, but we've held the project 12% uh, below that uh, at an FAR of 2.96. And uh, with the gross square uh, fl uh, floor area, uh, we, uh, the, the density bonus would allow 321,152 square feet, but we've held the project 12% below, about 40,000 square feet below the allowable at 281,482 square feet. Uh, here's a roof level plan. Um, we have a total of uh, 22,390 square feet of open space. Uh, that's a 60% um, increase over the initial plans. Uh, I'll walk you through that. Um, there is a, a Plaza A, a Plaza B. Uh, we've got the park on Adams. Um, there's a level two uh, podium open space um, in, in building A and uh, building B uh, podium open space. Uh, there's a roof deck uh, at level six of building A and a roof deck in building B. And then there are private patios at the, at the podium level um, all around uh, building A here and, and building B over here. And uh, note, we've also added um, the dog walk uh, and the, the clay street sidewalk widening, which provide amenity uh, for the project and the wider community. But um, but the dimensions uh, on a technical level don't quite meet the open space requirements. Uh, here are our unit plans for the project. Uh, so the, the townhouses entered off of Adams, uh, have a front porch, you come into the unit, there's a, a bonus sort of office room, um, a garage uh, that's parked uh, through the easement side. Uh, coming up to the main floor, there's a kitchen, living, dining, and then three bedrooms on the top floor. Uh, there are also three bedroom apartments that are around uh, 1,300 uh, square feet, um, uh, two types of uh, two bedroom units that are around 1,000 to 1,100 square feet, um, one bedroom units and lofts around 700 square feet and studios uh, that are around 500 square feet. So again, um, the uh, two and three bedrooms uh, are a total of 49% of the, of the project. Uh, so here's a view uh, looking north along San Pablo, uh, showing the richly articulated buildings with uh, bay windows, uh, strong corner uh, elements. Uh, here's a view from Brighton looking east. Uh, we'll note that easement uh, creates a natural break in the massing. Uh, we're proposing a complementary palette of rich earthy materials, uh, a brick veneer, integral color plaster, uh, core 10 steel uh, accents. And uh, ultimately, we're trying to create high quality buildings with careful detailing that stand the test of time. Uh, here's a view looking south along San Pablo, uh, showing the new uh, fabric of retail and the rich pedestrian streetscape. Uh, again, we're now 85% uh, glazing along San Pablo. Uh, and then the program elements like the bike rooms. Uh, have become opportunities for feature box windows to display photos, objects, and memorabilia. And these can be illuminated at night to enliven the streetscape and the pedestrian experience. Uh, here's a view looking south on San Pablo, again with strong corner elements, and very active rootscapes. A view from Adams and Clay looking north. Uh, a view from Adams looking east uh, towards a new larger park. Uh, dog walk uh, to the right, uh, townhouses to the left. Here's a close up view of the new larger redesigned park, family friendly features. Uh, you can also see the, the variation and rich palette for the townhouses. Uh, here's a close up view of the townhouses with front yards, porches, and decks. 
uh, detail of the townhouses with the new decorative screen railings, uh, variated rich color, uh, and, uh, and the balconies that are added to, to third every third home. Um, here are sections uh, uh, along Adams. Um, we'd note uh, at the townhouses here, we've held the townhouses below the daylight plane. Um, no building at all at the park, obviously. And then at building A, uh, the density bonus units uh, do go above the, uh, the daylight plane. But again, that, that's where we have stepped the building down and back. Uh, here's a landscape site plan uh, with lush planting, uh, new and existing street uh, trees around the streetscapes uh, and throughout the site. Um, here are detailed landscape plans at the ground level park and plazas. Uh, we're exploring art features that uh, may recall the bowling alley. Uh, we may have uh, reclaimed wood for community benches. Uh, maybe a, a bowling ball uh, water fountain. Uh, here are landscape plans at the podium levels of building A and B. Again, with uh, lush planting with large tree canopies and a range of seating and gathering areas. Uh, landscape plans at the roof decks of building A and B. Uh, both are landscaped and furnished and both have attached lounges uh, with restrooms. And we'd note that from the street, uh, these roof decks uh, really add to the activation of the facades and add to the sense of activity and vibrancy of the buildings. Uh, we see this as a very green project. Uh, it's really a model location and site for sustainable development, uh, being walkable to groceries and transit. Uh, we'll have electric bike charging stations with uh, 282 bikes, 34% uh, more than required. We'll have uh, easy car charging stations, uh, installed rooftop solar, um, all electric appliances within the units. And it's a project that will benefit Albany in many ways. Uh, it'll create a vibrant stretch of pedestrian oriented retail. It'll create uh, 12,243 square feet of publicly accessible onsite amenities, including a park, two plazas and sidewalk widenings. Um, it'll create 207 units of much needed housing. Uh, and it's a very family friendly park uh, uh, project uh, with a total of 102 family units. Um, that's 49% of the overall project, including townhouses. Um, and also uh, includes uh, family features like the ground level uh, family center, cargo bike parking, pet spa, and a, a family friendly park. And finally, it'll provide uh, 21 below market rate units uh, and 10 of those below market rate units are actually uh, larger family units, including a below market rate townhouse. Uh, so that concludes our presentation and uh, we're here for your, uh, your questions. Thank you so much for your presentation this evening. Before we uh, go to public comment, I will turn it over to Vice Mayor Jordan. If you wanna stop sharing your screen. Okay. All right, go ahead, Vice Mayor. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, I have a, a question and others may have questions before we go to public comment, but for that, uh, I own property with my wife that's between 1,500 and 1,000 feet from this project, uh, this project property, actually about 950 feet from this property. Um, and state law requires an analysis of a potentially reasonably foreseeable financial nexus around various factors of property. Uh, and so I've looked at those and don't see that there's any financial nexus. Um, I did previously do the same because I was 550 feet at this property from I think it was 423 Avalon. And in that case, I, um, the criteria indicated that there was a financial nexus, so I did recuse myself from that, but I don't, uh, the law doesn't seem to indicate that. Um, in this case, uh, my question was in the, the townhome that's ADA accessible, is it going to have a, a lift of some kind? Oh, the, um, the way that the accessibility works for these projects, um, the buildings A and B, which are all apartment flats, are all, um, every unit is uh, fully accessible within uh, chapter 11A of the building code. 
uh, townhouse units uh, fall under a different category for multi-story units. And uh, since they're obviously, you know, by their very nature, they include interior stairs. Uh, so they're, they're not accessible units. Uh, but uh, the code requires that 10% of the, the units um, have accessible ground floors. Uh, so th there will be ramping to the unit and uh, everything on the ground floor uh, will be accessible uh, within uh, and will meet the requirements of Chapter 11A uh, of the California Building Code. Okay, so somebody could, <clears throat> somebody who had those access limitations could potentially live in the, the bottom floor with yeah, support they, from those. They, they could live up. on the bottom floor or they could, they could have someone visit them. But, yeah. um, but obviously, as as units with two two flights of interior stairs, um, you know, it, it, uh, they're by, by their very nature uh, not going to be fully accessible. Um, and the the three bedroom units uh, within buildings A and B are a, a much better option. Thank you. All right, thank you, Vice Mayor. Are you going to recuse yourself? I'm sorry, I didn't hear. And I went to the questioning. Um, and now I have a particular, I'm not going to recuse myself because I don't feel that there's a reasonably foreseeable financial nexus and there is one um, particular safety concern that I think is easy to address, but should be addressed. Councilmember McQuaid. Um, yeah, I've got some questions. Um, I guess I also have a, have a question though, if to uh, Vice Mayor Jordan, is it, is it your decision if there's a financial nexus? I mean, I, I understand what you're saying, but I'm just kind of curious how this plays out. Is it your decision or is it somebody else's decision? Uh, I believe ultimately it's my decision. And should that not turn out to be the case, then I will take the hit. Okay. Um, so I, I have several different questions. One is about the parking. Um, can any of the commercial spatial spaces double for residential use? In other words, if a resident say wanted to use it from 10 at night till six in the morning, would that be permitted or how, how might that, how might that work? Uh, yeah, the, uh, you know, essentially the exterior parking is likely to be uh, first come first serve. Um, we've not, uh, talked about that in detail if some of them uh, would be reserved for um, uh, you know they might perhaps be reserved for uh, uh, some of the commercial tenants um, uh, but in, in general the, uh, the the residential parking is intended to be in the residential garages uh, under building a and B um, and those are secure, uh, and, and not open to the public. So uh, any any retail customers uh, could come and park in the, the central parking court, the outdoor parking. Could could residents park there though? Like, well, part of what I'm trying to do is be sure that there is commercial parking and if residents were to park there, there wouldn't be. Well, uh, uh, it, it would likely, you know, during the day uh, have time limits on it as well. Um, and, okay. uh, and and could be posted uh, for particular retail tenants as well. That's something that's quite common. Great, thank uh, you. That's a great point. Um, also, I'm thinking about parking. I understand that you're considering having non non bundled parking, which saves the tenant quite a bit of money. But what prevents the tenant then from parking in the neighborhood and and totally impacting the neighborhood? Um, you know, I. Well, that's that's my question. Well, uh, I mean, there there are certain locations where there are uh, parking permits in neighborhoods. You know, that's something that could be pursued here, uh, but we don't anticipate that. Um, you know, the 0.74 ratio is um, you know it is uh, a fair bit higher than the 0.5 that this uh, state code requires, um, and it's. Uh, on par with um, with other developments that the project sponsor ha has done, and uh, you know, seems to be the, the right amount. Um, no, I, I would agree it's the right amount of parking. I just want to be sure that the residents aren't 
not using it and to save money are impacting the neighborhood. Well, I mean, the, the you know, offering the convenient, you know, indoor secure parking, um, you know, I, I think is is what we can do, um, at, you know, as designers and um, as as project sponsors. Okay, thank you. Um, this maybe for Anne more than you. I'm not quite sure. On one of her slides, it mentioned that there's 198. ADA accessible units. Could one of you define a little more what ADA accessible actually means? Is it wider doorways? Is it uh, yeah. universal design toilets? Is that what that means? Yeah. So it, it's a um, you know it's an entire um, very long chapter of the California Building Code, uh, and but but it is sort of those things that you mentioned. Um, so for instance, in, in a private dwelling. Um, you know, just for instance, you know, you could have a bathroom door that's two foot two wide, uh, but but not not in one of these. So uh, in, in all of the buildings in A and B, which are elevator accessible units, um, uh, everything in the unit is wide enough for a wheelchair to go through all doorways. There are um, pull side clearances on all doors, for instance. There are turnarounds. Um, there are um, uh, free, free, clear space in front of um, sinks. Um, th there's wider areas around uh, toilets. There are um, uh, there's blocking in the walls um, for uh, to add grab bars. Uh, 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 but it, it's quite an extensive, um, you know, list, and it's you know it's probably fifty to eighty pages worth of requirements. Great, thank you so much. And my, I think my last question right now, I saw in one of your slides, there's a mural of a girl, it looks like she's watering the, the plants. Yeah. Is that really gonna happen or is that just there to tease me into thinking it's gonna happen? Because I think that's really great. We, we love it too. And, um, you know, it's, it's always our intention to get, um, you know, art and, um, you know, and craft and, and artful things into our projects. And uh, so, um, you know, it's aspirational, but, um, but you know, we're, we're gonna try to do as much of that as we can in the, in the final built project. Great, thank you. Good, I think that's it for me for now. Thank you. I'll go ahead and open it up for a public comment at this time. And we can give them three minutes. Go ahead, please. Good evening, my name is Ed Hernandez, 520 Adams Street. Uh, I, I, I just, I can't help but say how ironic and, and amusing the bowling ball fountain is. I think that's wonderful. Good humor someplace. Um, Anne Hirsch had mentioned very briefly something about uh, storm drainage. Um, and Mr. Stackhouse had covered uh, all of the above ground issues marvelously well. It, it, it looks lovely. I'm very interested in the below ground modifications, and I'm wondering if there's any plan to verify the integrity of the three foot by five foot corrugated metal pipe storm drain underlying the current Albany Bowl structure and parking lot, uh, and uh, to see uh, if there's any um, rehab that needs to be performed of breaches in the integrity of that uh, corrugated metal pipe. Also to certify the sufficiency of the carrying capacity of the concrete box culvert that bisects Adams Street uh, and extends the storm drain runoff to daylighted open trench of Middle Creek in its run under the orientation center um, service drive to Sarita Creek. And then uh, second, a suggestion in compensation for the loss of daylight plane to the affected current property owners of the 500 block of Adams Street. I would like to ask the council to consider extending a right of first refusal for purchase at an appropriate deep discount of up to 75 linear feet of each of the, I don't know, I think it's six or seven uh, narrow plotted spaces, um, uh, parcels 
that uh, uh, exists currently as open space running between the uh, pathway, the walking pathway from the north end of Madison Street northward to the bend in, uh, in Middle Creek where the Madison Street uh, open trench runoff crosses the walking path at the bottom of the stairway and the bridge. Okay, thank you for your comment. Next, please. Uh, good, good evening, uh, Madam Mayor and City Council members. My name is Nick Peterson. I'm a resident of Albany. I'm also a member of the Climate Action Committee, um, but I'm not speaking for the Climate Action Committee in my comments here. I'm just speaking as a, a citizen. I um, fully support this project. I think it has gone through a very well-vetted process. It has been very encouraging to see how the um, developer and architect have responded to comments that have been made uh, about the project from the public and from uh, other individuals involved. Um, I think this project is a good one. It, it, it sets a really good precedent for Albany for the next 50 years of development that we're looking for of a more sustainable type of city that has a little bit higher density, less use of cars, um, shared open space, and uh, energy efficiency and uh, all electric um, type construction. And I do encourage the designer and developer to look into, I, I know they haven't committed to fully all electric. There's still some gas hookups for potential commercial and water heating use, but I really encourage them to uh, move to fully all electric because that's what is gonna be required at some point in Albany between uh, coming up to 2045 when it will, I guess, be illegal to emit into the atmosphere in Albany. I don't know quite how we're gonna do that, but uh, we're gonna be zero, uh, zero carbon emissions by 2045. So anyway, I think this project uh, builds a good precedent. Um, other developments along uh, the corridor will need to be uh, of similar quality and caliber and thoughtfulness. And I just very much appreciate that we have this opportunity. I think it should be kudos to the property owners that they want to bring forward a project such as this uh, to our city. I think it's a great idea. I think it puts people living uh, in uh, acceptable density with acceptable amenities near very good transit options that aren't all mitigated on uh, the use of private cars. Yes, there will be individual individuals and families that have vehicles. And I think there are many opportunities to work out. Um, and I think one that was suggested, and I hope the developer does do, is to price uh, the parking accordingly so that they make sure that the, it, it's a value to the tenants and they're not driven to looking for not, not using it and trying to park on the streets. So um, very much in favor of this. I hope you approve it. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for your comment. Next, please. All right, I assume this is me. Um, yes. My name is Clay Larson. I, I, uh, this project certainly is moving along. I, I'm just looking back, the first formal meeting was in August, and now a little over two months later, we're we're getting ready to cut trees. So so that's that's great. I sent a couple of emails. Um, I commented on parking. I've commented in the past. Uh, I think the project is seriously underparked. I I and I know that that state density bonus law requirements set the set the maximums, if you will. But as Ann pointed out, the the, the parking was reduced by twenty five spaces based on on commission recommendations. The commission was never provided any real data regarding the, the parking impacts of the project and, and commissioners asked for it, but they weren't provided. So one commissioner relied on her experience in San Francisco, another looked to Copenhagen for, for direction. I also commented on the staff's insistence that the plan, uh, the project complies with, with the general plan and is consistent with the zoning ordinance. That's mainly a semantic issue. You can read what I wrote, but there are two new issues. Um, and and that's why I, I, and the first one I may have to backtrack on. I the, the staff report seems to indicate that 
that as, as a result of, of some inquiries by the Planning and Zoning Commission this last meeting that, that the project didn't satisfy the requirement for ground floor frontage. The staff report went on to note that the city attorney had determined, I'll read this again, a, a, that a concession could be used to grant the relief from the ground floor commercial. I checked, I looked at the application uh, for, for state density bonus waivers and concessions and I don't see that request. But I read and Ann repeated again tonight that they, he did, the, the applicant did ask for this. My, my question is, is, is that included anywhere in the packet? Um, and, and, and I assume the applicant showed identified actual cost reductions and uh, associated with, with the concession and the city staff reviewed those and found those to be, to be convincing, but I don't see any record of this. So I don't know if this is back channel communications where, where this was result. Finally, I, I raised the issue and I don't think this will go too far, but I raised the issue. I, I don't think this project is really exempt from seeker review. I think the, the, the level, the intensity of the infield development it is, and I tried to detail this in, in my note, it is much greater than contemplated by the, by the 2035 general plan. So I think it's not reasonable to presume that the project is covered by the CEQA approval of the, of the old general plan. Those are my comments. And I would like to hear more from staff about, the, um, about this mysterious third concession. Again, the applicant specifically and proudly notes that he only asked for two concessions, but the staff report suddenly for the first time now refers to three concessions. Thank you. Thank you for your comment. Next, please. Thank you. Um, I'm Nick Pilch, Vice Chair of the Planning and Zoning Commission, but speaking for myself, I just wanted to raise another voice in support of this project, which brings us badly needed housing, and which I believe will add a great deal of vitality to this part of the Albany and to the whole of the city as well. I appreciate the process and the efforts of the architect who've done a great job, by the way, and who accommodated our requests well, and the work of the staff and the work of my fellow commissioners. This dense development will bring more people to our local businesses, more people and therefore more vitality to our streets and is the right type of development for San Pablo Avenue, a transit corridor, and it will bring the vitality to Northern Albany. <laughs> it's a transit corridor and it's in Northern Albany, which is well within walking distance of El Cerrito Park. As far as parking goes, we don't know the parking in the neighborhood will be a problem. Tenants moving there will be aware of the amount of parking and tenants will choose to live there or not in part based on their view of the amount of parking. Therefore, I believe the project, it seems to me, will attract tenants who will take advantage of the robust transit options, the ease of walking and bicycling in our small town and not worry so much about uh, having a car or parking. And to further our very important climate action goals, we want fewer cars. However, if spillover parking does become a problem, planning manager Ann Hirsch has told us that we told us how we may proceed to institute a neighborhood parking permit program. Such a program has come up many times at the commission, mostly in discussions of the blocks adjacent to Solano, as I recall. And so it may soon come the time for this sort of parking management to come to Albany, which many, many cities avail themselves of. Um, and as far as ground floor commercial goes, we can build all the empty storefronts we want, but I think that developers and the architects know uh, how much, how many storefronts will actually get filled. And that's one of the reasons why they do not, uh, I believe, do not have the entire uh, frontage at San Pablo as storefronts. However, they did uh, make sure that the uses to, to further to the, to the extent possible were active uses, such as having the uh, family center uh, and, uh, and uh, other uh, facilities located at the front. So facilities that were, would remain active um, in the day and, and evening as well. So uh, just another voice in support of this project. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Next, please. Uh, hi, my name is Brian Martin. I live at the 16th block of Adam Street. I uh, wanted to um, say that I, I do recognize the, the need for uh, a lot more housing in Albany, in particular affordable housing. And um, a, a development like this does provide that. It provides other benefits, uh, but it also does have uh, negative impacts. And any dense development 
um, particularly one that's under parked is going to uh, have negative impacts wherever it is. And so, uh, as I mentioned in writing, I encourage the city to uh, do whatever it can to make uh, plans for um, supporting the people that actually live in the development and that live in the surrounding areas to, um, uh, you know, get along in that new reality that Albany is transitioning into. Um, and uh, to also um, thoughtfully consider and seriously consider issues of uh, equity if the city is planning to try to get um, all of its housing quota of a thousand plus units along this one street, uh, thereby impacting uh, most the, the, uh, the neighborhoods that are right here and not other parts of town which are equally close to transit and shops. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. Next, please. Hi, my name is Dan Johnson. Uh, I'm calling to uh, say that this is a great building. I support the project. I support the height. I support the density. I support the number of units. Um, just want to get that out of the way. But also, you, council, you should be aware that this building is a big fossil fuel polluter. Uh, there was a slide that said this building is very green. That was a green green fringe on the thing. Um, this is my job as doing HVAC engineering for buildings. Um, it's it's ex emotionally exhausting to call into all of these and just and to beg the council and the commissions to follow the climate action plan that Albany has in place. Um, we have 200 new homes here and all with gas fired hot water, right? So you can make hot water using electricity, using heat pumps. Every other major city in the Bay Area has passed a gas ban that, and they're not slowing down on their affordable housing. They're like, it's continuing apace. They just switched over to less polluting fuels. And it's a policy failure of Albany government that we don't have a gas ban in place. So, on top of the car storage that already exists at the Albany Bowl, we, we have 40 net new uh, gasoline parking spots in this development. So if you're trying to advance the climate action plan, you're piling on top of all the existing problems, 200 new homes of gas fired hot water, 40 new gasoline parking spaces. Uh, you can see where, where we have a problem here. So it's really easy to make this right. All you have to do is say, this needs to be an all electric project. And you can you cannot have any net new gasoline car storage spaces on this property. If you want to park cars, fine, but they've got to have electric charging. So thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comment. Next, please. <coughs> Hi, my name is Chris. I live in the community as well. And um, there are a lot of things I support about this project, but I want to today voice concerns about the lack of research and consideration of impact on the residents of Clay Adams and Madison in particular. I agree with um, Clay Larson earlier that skipping CEQA review is a disservice to the residents. Um, 0.5 spaces per unit may be higher than the reduced state code, but that's only because of the, the bonus reductions. Um, I found it somewhat offensive to say we don't know parking will be a problem. I live here. It's already a problem. It's already tight. It's, it's not a problem, but it's difficult. Adding anything is going to, especially something this dense, unprecedentedly dense in this residential area, is going to make things a lot worse. All but one of the planning and zoning committee members dismissed urgent residents' concerns about parking and traffic. Um, they even, as noted, requested that it be reduced, the amount of parking offered. But this project is adding into a single block more units and vehicles than presently exist in eight blocks down any of the affected residential streets. If in line with Bay Area and averages, then even if all the unbundled spaces are utilized, we'll see an overflow of more than 150 cars into a tiny residential area where, where spaces are already barely available. The idea is that they want to encourage greener transportation and use fewer cars, but doing it this way is kind of like peddling trickle-down theory. It sounds lovely, but it actually hurts the audience. It sounds like it will serve. Um, the idea that, well, if we don't offer parking spaces, instead of impacting the community, these people 
people will just go green is kind of laughable. They're, it's going to be the local area that's going to be hurt by this. Not 150 people aren't suddenly going to sell their cars. And the solutions proposed, mentioned twice tonight, uh, make zero cent. Parking permits have nothing to do with this particular area, which not like when you're Solano and there's going to be a lot of temporary visitors to the area and permits could solve that problem. Permits, the only way that would make sense is if the, the new 540 San Pablo zone was on a different permit zone than Adams, Addison, uh, um, Adams and Clay. Um, otherwise, it's only injury to injury to make people around here pay to park their own cars in far more difficult circumstances and subsidize the rest of the Albany community uh, to do it. So there was no pushback or consideration of the nearby residents on the part of the majority of the committee who understandably wanted to encourage lots of housing, um, but did nothing really to stand up and protect local in, uh, residents from the negative impact. I think we need a study and in particular, a, a parking study, but also traffic. A lot of people are gonna cut through the sleepy children filled street of Madison because it's going to become the fastest way to get to the freeway. Um, and a lot of these people will be, will, will be more, a lot more be parking here. So um, I think just traffic study and parking study to know how safe is this and do other actions need to be taken to build it better, um, to protect the, the residents here and the residents who will be coming in. Thank you. Thank you so much for your comment. I believe that's it. We'll go ahead and bring it back to council and staff. There were a couple of questions that I want to see if staff or the applicant would like to address before council. Go ahead, Ann. Happy to kind of start um, going with perhaps a little bit random order, but do my best to address those questions which came up. Um, on the matter of the concession for the uh, ground floor space, um, we after the last meeting with the Planning Commission realized that um, a concession would be needed to uh, modify this aspect of the project. And so I worked with Mala, our city attorney, um, to understand the appropriate course um, in addressing that issue. And then uh, shortly after that meeting, I had an extensive conversation uh, with the applicant who was amenable to um, pursuing that concession on the ground floor uh, commercial requirements. So that was how that evolved. Um, and that's and that's where we are. If you have technical questions about the use of that concession, Mala is obviously here to, to answer those questions for you. Um, with respect to CEQA, um, there, we worked with our CEQA consultant um, and there is nearly a 300 page um, document with supporting appendices um, to support that determination. This wasn't simply a matter of making a proclamation. Um, we worked with a consultant to do a pretty extensive um, review and that is part of the information in the record for the council to, to review as part of your determination on CEQA. Um, specifically with respect to traffic and parking, parking is not an impact under the California Enquir Environmental Quality Act guidelines, which is why um, it's not studied as part of the uh, CEQA process. Uh, similarly, um, pursuant to section 15064.3B1, um, Traffic is not an impact if the subject site is located with a ha within a half a mile of transit, which this, this subject site is. So um, that is included as part of that, 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 that section, which um, effectively eliminates the need for uh, a traffic study as part of the project scope. And I think those are, those are the, the high points. Okay. Are there any council members that have any questions? by Council Member Nason. Yeah, um, and I'll, I'll, I start off also with a, a question to Vice Mayor Jordan, or perhaps this is a question for the city attorney. If, um, uh, if there is uh, some objection from anyone to uh, Vice Mayor Jordan's participation in this decision uh, because of the proximity of his home to the project, uh, would that, it, is there any risk to the, our decision on the project? Would, is there a, a, is the risk totally on him that he could be fined or something? Uh, or is there a risk that we would, that the decision would have to be done over? or any other consequence 
that council we need member nason i just wanted to confirm i've obviously provided advice to the council but i would like to confirm that the council would like me to answer that publicly i'm seeing uh council member mcquaid nod um but i'm not seeing any other nods well we've had this the statement that uh that this is on vice mayor jordan so i guess we accept that i don't know what else to do all right well let me ask some other questions um i did not understand mr hernandez's comment um and i was wondering if that is something uh, that can be explained. Um, and also curious, uh, I, did, I, I did not realize we were not going to have the heat pumps in this building. Can we hear a little bit about that? Yeah, thank you um, for reminding me about the initial question related to the storm drain um, and the site drainage. Currently, there is a major storm drain pipe that runs underneath um, the property. It is. Um, uh, quite old, um, and it is going to be likely upgraded and relocated um, as part of this project scope. I know that um, there's obviously a civil engineering team involved that has looked at that issue. Um, Isaiah may have more specific details, but that that's the condition that Mr. Hernandez referred to, and that is something that um, you know, will be upgraded as part of this project. Okay. Um. Yep, go ahead. Yeah, I could add to that, that you know, uh, replacing the storm drain, uh, and that will all be, you know, reviewed and permitted as well. Um, uh, and, oh, the, the, the question about the, the heat pumps, um, you know, it's, it's something that will be determined uh, during the, uh, the building permit review process. It, it hasn't been determined that we absolutely will use gas heating, um, but it, it's, uh, it, it's something that we'll, we'll be determining at the next step. Um, and we'll, we'll certainly do everything we can to get as much of the equipment to be electric as we can, um, you know, within the range of making sure that the project is still feasible. Um, it, uh, and so, um, the, you know, there, there are certain things that we know for certain that, that we um, can do uh, definitely and easily within the budget, like making uh, the units all electric. And, and some of the decisions um, need to be made uh, when we have more information, more detailed pricing, um, when, when the uh, you know, engineers have drawn up multiple systems, the, the contractors pricing them. Um, it, it's just um, a little early in the process uh, to know for sure, um, you know, exactly uh, the extent of what's going to be feasible. Um, I wish that weren't the answer, but that's, you know, we don't want to ultimately, um, you know, we, we want to make sure that this project gets built and that we're not here wasting everyone's time. And, um, and it's not easy to build these things. Uh, and uh, we don't want to, you know, commit to something today that, that risks making it not buildable later. And would that also be the case for electrical charging? Is that also part oh, of- No, there's definitely going to be uh, EV charging uh, spaces, um, uh, uh, both for bikes and for cars. And, and there will also be uh, rooftop solar. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I, I do want to say that I, I'm very impressed with the, uh, the look uh, that is presented. It seems to be a, a higher quality uh, of architecture than, than some of the residential that I have seen built along San Pablo Avenue and very, well, thank very you. happy. You know, we're, we're, we're really excited and uh, we love it too. We can't wait to build it. And I was also happy to see the bowling ball fountain. Uh, I was sort of hoping you'd keep some of the neon, but uh, I think that's, that's uh, wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Ready, any other questions? Later already. Thank you, Doc.
All right, Councilman McQuaid. Um, thank you. I, I think I have more comments if you're ready for comments at this point. They seem to be blending. Go ahead. Thank you. Um, yeah, I would agree. This is a, a great project. It's. I think the changes that you've made have been have been good, and it's been nice to watch it kind of go from being <coughs> good to being better. Um, I do like the bowling ball, the bowling ball fountain too. I think that's great. And if you could incorporate some of the wood from the actual bowling alley, that would be fabulous. Um, and I really like the corner design. I don't know that I would have noticed that so much had you not called it out, but I think it makes the building stand out a little more than just a flat corner building. Um, I would agree that certainly heat pumps would be a high priority. Maybe I think, you know, work, do everything you can to get those incorporated. Um, you know, this is our first really big housing project in a very long time. So we wanna be sure that we're doing it correctly. And this is the model going forward. But I, and I also think, you know, this, this one is on San Pablo Avenue and many of our housing will be there. But we also need to be considering all parts of the city with a variety of options for increasing the housing in different ways throughout the entire city. Uh, we're very constrained by state law these days, but I think it's important that we find solutions that, that work for us, that work for Albany. And I think we're on the right track with this one. Thank you. Thank you. Can I Councilmember Uh Yeah, so thank you to staff uh, and the developers for that detailed presentation, the staff report, uh, both very helpful um, and covered a hell of a lot of ground on um, a pretty complicated issue of how you know, to develop a project, um, which I know has boggled my mind more than once uh, when I've had to understand it. Uh, to echo some of what the other council members have said, I think this project looks really good. Uh, you know, having looked at many projects like this that have gone through these long processes, I think it's really exemplary how much has been done to respond to concerns that uh, the developer strictly did not have to. Um, you know, state law ties our hands a lot of the time nowadays, which I think in many cases is a good thing. Uh, but obviously steps have been taken. This project has improved a lot since it was first uh, suggested. And I think that's the result of staff and our planning commission and developers all working together. Um, and I think that's that's really great. Um, as people said, this is the biggest housing project we, we've gotten in a long time and I think are likely to get for a long time. Uh, and I think that's really great. The, only really substantive thing I wish is that it could be even more housing. We need a lot in the city uh, and all over the Bay. Uh, but I think this one works. Um, to say just a teensy bit about parking, which we always tend to discuss whenever we talk about these things. Um, you know, we every time I've talked to uh, Jeff Bond over in community development, he says that we've done several parking studies over the last couple of years of Albany, and all of them have come out the same, that there's been not a ton of significant change and that there's not a huge amount of pressure on our parking. Um, and so that's that's the, the data we're basing this on. But I, I also wanted to say that this is also a, a value judgment. This is weighing options. Um, and it's the option of having more housing versus potentially having uh, parking issues. I completely empathize with the people who say this might be an issue in their community, in, in their neighborhood, but I think this is just based on our values. We have to support housing like this, especially when it is providing quite a bit of parking. I think we'd be, these concerns would come up if there were 50 more spaces and if there were 50 less spaces. I, there's no amount of parking that I think does not result in a convers long conversation about it uh, when you're talking about housing in the Bay Area. Um, and this goes above and beyond what is required. Um, and then just lastly, uh, Councilman McQuaid mentioned this briefly, but you know, this is the first big project we've got. We're doing a San Pablo Avenue plan to hopefully encourage more projects like this where we can have them, but that's not the only place we're gonna have them. We also are gonna have a, a new housing element process, which is started in earnest and we are going to talk a lot more about soon that we'll talk about where else we can have housing. I think San Pablo is probably the best place to put big projects like this just because there's nowhere else in Albany that really has a space like the bowl that can be converted into this big of a project. But 
we will be talking about other places to put housing so it's not just all in this one neighborhood um, and with that i think this project's really great and i support it thank you thank you council member team and uh, vice mayor jordan I agree with much of what's been said. Um, I'm going to share my screen with uh, Mayor's agreement. Visual thinker. Okay, thanks. Um, so just, uh, I was concerned about parking as well. So I did some research online. Um, amazingly found this Berkeley parking study that uh, surveyed 20 different multi-residence buildings in Berkeley, you can probably find it online if you search for that. Um, this was the key table to me. And so they got agreement from the management of each of these properties to be able to go in at night and survey the uh, uh, number of parking spaces that were being utilized for the occupancy. And uh, what they found was that the 80th percentile um, building, the occupancy was 0 0.73 uh, cars per residence even though the supply was greater than that. So that provided some comfort. You know, that doesn't necessarily mean this is how, that's how this will turn out, but I was interested that the applicant is proposing 0.74. Um, I don't know if that's a coincidence, probably so. Uh, um, I do have a, a particular safety concern that I think can be hopefully dealt with fairly easily. Um, so this is the, the entryway for motorists to the parking lots off of San Pablo. And this is a picture looking north along the sidewalk as it currently exists. And this is a picture looking south along the sidewalk as it currently exists. And maybe others can think of places like this, but I, I couldn't think of any place where there is a signal that is controlling a sidewalk. Um, I'm concerned that people who are talking to each other or distracted on a phone, uh, you know, any, any number of possibilities are going to be looking down and see it's a sidewalk and walk right out into traffic. Um, so my uh, suggestion, and I mentioned in hearing the, um, the, the Project Architects reaction to this, is to actually make this more of a standard intersection. So instead of having a driveway, um, having it as a road at road grade and then having curb ramps to either side. So it really reads to people that you're about to cross the street, look up, look ahead and look alive. Uh, and with that, I will stop sharing. Thank you, Vice Mayor Jordan. Um, I just want to echo some of the comments that have already been made. I think this is a fabulous project. I like the, the architect. I like the, the, everything that, that it brings to the city. Um, you know, as always, my concern is just affordability and the equity component of housing. And I do know that there are affordable or below market rate units available, but it, it still is, is a concern because what we consider as below market rate and no parking or not enough parking, what audience are we targeting, right? You know, most families that have, um, that are below market or we say affordable um, housing elements, they, they have families and, and they use transportation. So to, to say that, you know, no, you can't live here or to imply that this is not the place for you because you have one or two cars, it's just simply not um, something I'm in agreement with, especially when we're, we're trying to figure out what audience are we targeting, right? So with that said, um, I, I, I like the design, like I said, I, I think that um, housing is needed, but you know, I just want it to be within our equity component, you know, what, what audience and make sure that we're, we're targeting people that need housing. So, uh, what, if I could, any, go ahead, Vice Mayor Jordan. Yeah, yeah, if I could um, run on with that. Uh, it did occur to me that, that the car parking um, being unbundled, there's no pairing to the affordable residences that are going to be created. So aside from the question I just raised about the safety of that intersection on the sidewalk and, and a possible solution, I'm curious the applicant would be open to making parking spaces available to the residents of the affordable units 
at a price ratio that is the same as the price ratio of the rent of that unit to the market rate units. So in other words, they would get it at the same, they would get a parking space at the same discount if they should desire to have one as they get the, the actual living space. Um, because otherwise they get, we're not extending the equity to the car parking, we're pricing them out of the car parking. Well, on the first point, um, definitely the the idea of changing the, the curb lines at the, at the driveway, definitely something that we can look at. It's an interesting concept, um, and uh, we can definitely look at that. Uh, in, in terms of the financials, I think I would need to check in with the project sponsors and, and anything that's, that's so directly financially related, not really a, a design issue. Um, but, but certainly, you know, overall, um, you know, the, the idea, you know, the, the project, um, you know, without the project, there are 21 fewer below market rate units in Albany and with the project, there are 21 more. Uh, and um, so, you know, 21 is not as big as a, as a, you know, sort of entire affordable building, but there are a lot of affordable buildings that are only 40 or 50 units. So, um, you know, and, and those projects can take years and, um, and, and large sums of city money. So this is a, you know, a, a private developer, um, you know, uh, providing, you know, like, like half a building's worth of affordable units, um, you know, to Albany. So, um, you know, uh, it's something we're proud of. Um, yeah, so for my part on those two points, I mean. Um, uh, I can go ahead. Okay. Yeah, uh, uh, one, I, thing I we, one thing we would say, um, I did just get one note that um, uh, Kim can convey, which is that, um, for instance, one of the family units is a townhouse unit. Uh, and so that, that one does come with parking. Uh, so the, 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 the below market rate townhouse unit will, um, by its very nature, uh, come with, you know, essentially uh, below market rate um, uh, parking as well. I just and want to clarify, if I if I may, if that's okay. Um, the the project before you tonight, we're looking specifically at the design review and the density bonus. The issue of pricing parking as part of a private project is um, operational in nature, and that's not something that um, is part of what's been presented. We we have much discretion with. Um, you know, there is not a conditional use permit associated with the entitlements. If there were, that would give us more flexibility um, to, to put that request upon the developer. But I think right now with the focus being on density bonus compliance and site plan design and architecture, I'm not sure that we really have the authority to um, ask them to price, um, you know, price things with, with specificity. All right, uh, Council Member Nason, and then we'll go ahead and move forward to take a motion on these resolutions. Go ahead, Council Member Nason. Yeah, I, I hear what, um... Ann Hirsch is saying that this is not something we are uh, taking up tonight, but I still wanted to push back a little bit on the idea that, uh, you know, that there's a social justice need to um, provide below market rate parking. I think that part of what we're trying to achieve uh, in planning for the Bay Area is creating uh, a place where one of the ways that we serve our social justice objectives is to make it unnecessary for families uh, to have a car or perhaps to have one car, you know, to, to um, reduce the auto reliance uh, on cars and that that's actually one of the um, financial incentives for living close in when you can get so much more room uh, out further out, uh, uh, but then really do have to rely on a, on a car. So I just wanted to, uh, to push back on that a little bit. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Uh, we'll go ahead, Council Member Tito, go ahead and get a motion. I can't hear you. Sorry, I have a quick, 
comment and then a motion, but uh, before that, Councilmember McQuaid actually had her hand up first. Oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead, Councilmember McQuaid. No problem. Um, yeah, I'm not sure I, I agree with Councilmember Nason, but that's a conversation to be had later, I think. And I understand what, um, what Ann Hirsch is saying, but I would like to support the idea of having the parking fee, the bundle parking fee, to be lower for um, the affordable units. It doesn't make a lot of sense to me to be paying almost as much for your car as, as you are for your for the rent. So if there's anything that can be done about that, that would, I think, serve us well and serve our community well. Okay, Councilmember Tiedemann and then Vice Mayor Jordan. Uh, so I just wanted to say, I, you know, it's always good to have these equity concerns in our mind. I think in this case, we are getting what we're getting in this respect because of state density bonus, uh, which is what's allowed this developer to make this project pencil out. Uh, I'd say if we all want to make sure that future projects have even more of an affordable element, then we should probably start considering our own local density bonus uh, and what that might look like. Um, and, and that's it. And I'd be ready to make a motion, but I want to give Vice Mayor Jordan the chance Jordan, to make comments. Are you comment? Yeah, I just want to say I'm, I'm, I wasn't meaning to uh, imply holding up the project. It's just an opportunity to have a conversation with the architect. And I, given all the changes they made and how well you have listened, Mr. Sackhouse, thank you. Um, I strongly take on faith that you will raise this with the, uh, the property owner developer. Um, for a conversation along with potentially that intersection. Um, a couple of other quick suggestions. Um, I think swapping the, the waste bins and the bike parking in the townhomes um, in position would be helpful because right now somebody to get their bike out, they've got to go between the cars and the waste bins and it's, it's harder to get out and they might end up scratching the car. Um, I will you know, I'm interested in still having external access to those bike frames because I'm nervous about, you know, a parent taking two six-year-olds or a six-year-old and a four-year-old or a six-year-old and an eight-year-old through the parking garage because kids do get run over by cars being backed up by motorists. Um, I think there's might be a way to do it. Uh, Evoc Technologies runs Bike Link. Um, they've been doing this for 15 years. They run numerous bike frames that have direct access to the outside. Um, but I might contact you outside of this because that's not really an issue for here and now. Um, and then finally, the, the bike racks that are specified are the same, uh, exterior bike racks are specified are the same as the, the bike racks in El Cerrito. They're a rather large tube, large diameter. Um, they've been found not to work that well uh, because the tube is so large, it's hard to get many locks around them. So I would encourage you to use a an inverted flat top U from the same manufacturer that you have a Kashi for, which is well, um, and or buy a couple more bike bike racks. Each of those bike bike racks is designed to park four bikes. So if you buy two more of those, that would satisfy and those have become sort of iconic of Albany now. Um, Albany actually purchased one to put it underneath its Welcome to Albany sign on Solano years ago. So I think in terms of differentiating you know, you're arrived, you've arrived in Albany, that would be a, a little sort of signifier that, that people have arrived in Albany. Thank you very much. Thank you. Council Member Uh So with that, I would like to move that the council adopt resolution number 2021-106 and resolution number 2021-107. Second. All right, go ahead and what a roll call add. Councilmember Mason? Aye. Councilmember Tiedemann? Yes. Mayor Gary? Aye. Vice Mayor Jordan? Yes. Councilmember McQuay? Yes. And the motion right. carried. Thank you so much for your time, Isaiah Steakhouse, and Anne. Thank you for your presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. We'll go ahead and move to line item 9 2. Go ahead and get a staff report um, from Mom. Go ahead, please. Thank you, Mayor Carey. What you have before you is an urgency ordinance that extends the date of repayment for commercial tenants to a date certain. As you are aware, um, we adopted an urgency moratorium for commercial tenants that expired on September 30th of 2021 based on the governor's executive order. 
our moratorium provided for a repayment period that would start 12 months from when our local emergency expired. Our local emergency is still going and we are not at this point recommending terminating it given the Delta variant. So therefore, in order to provide some sort of certainty for both tenants and landlords, we're recommending a date certain of one year past when the moratorium expired, which would be September 30th, 2022 for a repayment period. I'm happy to answer any questions, but at this point, the recommendation is to adopt the urgency ordinance, um, which will require a four-fifths vote of the council. All right. Thank you so much, uh, city attorney. Does any council members have any questions, concerns, or comments? All right, I will we'll open it up to the public. Let's see any. All right, I'll bring it back to the council. Councilmember Nason, I see your mic is off. Did you have a question? You want to make a motion? Uh, yes, I'll I'll move. Go ahead. This up. I will move the item. Thank you. Thank you. Seconded. All right, let's go ahead and get a roll call. Councilmember McQuay. Yes. Councilmember Nason? Yes. Councilmember Tiedemann? Yes. Mayor Gary? Yes. Vice Mayor Jordan? Yes. Motion carries. Thank you so much. Thank you, City Attorney. But before we move, it looks like it's 1021 before we go into new business. I would like to extend the time to, let's do 11 o'clock just to be safe. Second it. All right, can we get a roll call? Mayor Gary? Yes. Vice Mayor Jordan? Yes. Council Member McQuay? Yes. Council Member Nason? Yes. Council Member Tiedemann? Yes. All right, thank you. Let's go down to line owner number 11, which is new business. We'll go ahead and get a staff report regarding multifamily electric vehicle charging pilot program. Go ahead, please. Thank you. Share my screen. Sorry, I'm having an issue sharing it. One second. Sorry, one second, it's gonna restart. There we go. Can you guys all see that okay? Yes, everything's good, thank you. Thank you for waiting. Um, good evening, mayor and council members. Thank you for waiting for that. Um, I'm gonna speak to you tonight a little bit about a proposal for a multifamily electric vehicle charging pilot program. And I'll try to be brief since I know it's late. So I'll start off with a little background about electric vehicles. Um, Albany's Climate Action and Adaptation Plan has a goal that 98% of passenger vehicles will be electric by 2045. And this plays a major role in the overall cap goals. Um, as you can see in this chart on the side here, this is the overall greenhouse gas emissions for the city in 2019. And this large green section, which actually makes up over half of the total, is transportation. So electric vehicles are a major part of the larger greenhouse gas reduction goals. And being able to meet those 98% EV goals is um, very much wrapped up in multifamily buildings. These are really important for a number of reasons. One of the main ones is that there's just a lot of residents, 43%, who live in these buildings. And in many cases, the people living in the multifamilies also have less access to electric vehicles in general. It's harder to get access to charging and they're more expensive. So it's very important that we create access and are involved in this process. There's also some other challenges that come with multifamily buildings, um, incentives in particular, because as a tenant, it's very difficult to get a charger installed in your building. And as a building owner, you're probably not gonna be the one using the charger. There might be some concerns about cost, how the electricity will be paid for, whether they're going to be used, some chicken and egg issues. 
And then there's also technical complexities that come with various types of apartment buildings um, that are often a little bit trickier to deal with than with single family homes. So with all of those things in mind, the Climate Action Committee uh, proposed a pilot program to focus on multifamily buildings in particular. And they um, made a subcommittee to develop a proposal working with staff. Climate Action Committee then discussed this on their September 15th meeting and recommended that the council approve the program as proposed tonight and allocate funds from Measure DD to pay for it. And before I go into some details about this pilot program, I'm just gonna briefly talk about some other local programs and how this is different. So um, PG&E, the Air Quality Management District and Cal EV EVIP are also, they have um, programs for incentives for EV chargers in various types of buildings, including multifamily. Um, they all offer various levels of incentives per charger. And they're also very, very in demand. So the PG&E program has been full for some time. It's not accepting applications anymore. The air quality district program is full for this year already. It's very competitive and it also prioritizes disadvantaged communities, which Albany doesn't have any of, um, at least in its technical definition. And then the Cal EVIP program is opening up in December and it's expected to be oversubscribed within an hour. So it's possible that Albany might be able to participate in these programs, but they alone are not going to solve the multifamily charging uh, concern, the issue in the city. And they also have a different goal. They're trying to just, you know, incentivize as many chargers as possible. But this pilot program is, it's of course very focused on creating EV access and awareness for the tenants in the buildings, but it's also very much focused on information and experience for the city itself and being able to inform future policies and programs having to do with electric charging infrastructure. So the idea of this, po of this pilot program is to allow city staff to gather data, understand all the technical aspects, the logistics, barriers, opportunities to create relationships with tenants and building owners and other stakeholders, and um, to really kind of get the ball rolling for future strategies. So with that, I'll tell you a little bit about the program as proposed. So it would start with um, focus groups for building owners and tenants, basically to just, you know, get some starting information and understand the community and the issues a little bit more. And there would be a building selection process um, with two to three medium sized buildings being chosen to participate in the program. And the selection process would prioritize low income and disadvantaged groups. And then with each of these buildings, staff would work closely throughout the entire process of technical evaluation, planning, permitting, installation to guide the buildings and also to gather as much information as possible about the process itself, um, the hangups, all the different pieces of it. And there would be up to $15,000 per building for incentive funding. So that would be just a portion of the total cost of each project. Um, and it wouldn't necessarily be all the way to 15,000 for each building, that's the maximum. And then we would also be doing outreach to the building tenants to make sure that they were aware of resources and incentives for electric vehicles. The total budget for the program would be a maximum of $50,000. So that's the maximum 15,000 for each of the three sites, plus $5,000 for data collection and outreach. So it could potentially be less than this, but this would be the maximum. And over here on the side, you can see this is an example funding break breakdown for a site. So not necessarily what it might be, but you know, just an example. So here we have a technical analysis for $5,000 and then theoretically um, funding $1,000 for 10 chargers, which might be about 20% of the total cost. And that would equal $15,000 for, for a given site. And um, none of this budget covers staff time. And with that, the staff recommendation is to authorize staff to create the multifamily electric vehicle charging pilot program 
know it's a mouthful, and fund and track the program with revenues associated with Measure DD. And I'm happy to answer any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Michelle, for your uh, presentation. I have a quick question for you, and I definitely love the idea. But my concern is for, for property that is open to the public, that's not gated or anything, how are we going to minimize access to just the residents in the apartment complex versus anyone bringing a vehicle there to utilize? Um, that's a great question. I think in, in many cases, the parking for multifamily buildings is, is underneath the first habited story. Um, and, you know, I suppose it's possible that someone could sneak in and park their car there, but it is a private parking lot. So I think effectively that would be dealt with in the same way as, as anyone parking illegally in a par private parking lot now. Um, theoretically, I suppose, depending on the technology, there could be security measures to make sure that the electric, the electric power is only accessible if you have a certain card or something like that. Yeah, um, I think that in most cases when you're losing like the laundromat, you have that or any in the apartment complex, you have to have this particular card and to use that. So I think that's something that should be implemented because, you know, like you said, anyone could go in charge and which will ultimately take away from the residents that actually live there and um, use the services. So I think that would be something that we would want to consider if we pass. So thank you so much. Any other questions from council? Comments? Vice Mayor Jordan, go ahead, please. Thank you, Mayor. Thank you for the report. Exciting, exciting progress, uh, exciting proposal. Did, it kind of went by fast. $1,000 per charger was estimated to be what percent of the total cost of the charger? Um, we put 20% there, but you know, that's, that's a guess, but you know, it could be widely various depending on the charger type in the building um, so that was really just for the sake of example okay and so so yeah i didn't, didn't pick up on this before that slide so thanks so much for the slide so the, the idea is that the property owner is going to pick up most of the costs yeah so the incentive funding would just be a portion the property owner would be paying the rest of the cost or okay. you know they they could get a grant or something like that but yeah, although as you indicated, the likelihood of they're getting a grant is yeah, it's playing the lottery. Um, well, I guess part of what we'll learn on the pilot is how much, what percentage do you have to offer to get anybody to, to take a bite at it? Um, has staff talked so the the Alameda County Energy Council um, staff has run um, multi-residence building electrical vehicle charging program for the Bay Area Quality Management District. So they presumably have experience administering these programs. Uh, have you spoken with those staff or has anybody else from Albany spoken with those staff? I can't say I have. Um, I'll let someone else speak up, speak up if they have. I took a look at that earlier this morning and it looked like they were basically helping people apply for the air quality management's program rather than um, doing the actual installation incentives themselves. Mm -hmm. um, but I haven't spoken with them about any of the details, so I can't speak to that. Okay, thanks very much. You're muted, Mayor. All right, anyone else? All right, we'll go ahead to public comment. Looks like we have two. Let's give them two minutes, please, Anne. <clears throat> Good evening, uh, Nick Peterson again speaking uh, with you. Thank you for giving me the opportunity to. Again, I'm not being, I, I am on the Climate Action Committee and I did work on the subcommittee to bring this proposal forward. And one of the things I wanted to point out is that this is actually going to be a big learning experience for the city staff. And we're beginning to see a lot of, um, of what needs to happen is for us to gain more data, get more adept at uh, communicating and outreaching 
to the residents and property owners in Albany. And that's a skill set that is sorely needed and can't just be contracted out all the time with any reasonable cost efficiency. So part of what the pilot is, it has a lot of open-ended questions like, how do you secure this? Make sure other people don't use it. How much should the building owner pay? Uh, we're not gonna be giving away free chargers to building owners. I mean, it's a profit-making business. They make money, they're charging high rents. So they should put some skin in the game. So again, uh, there's a lot happening in this pilot project that we're gonna learn and we're gonna be able to apply. And then going forward, it will work into developing a much larger, more uh, informed program for getting uh, EV usage to people who are, are renting in apartment buildings. So that's kind of the goal. I mean, it, it's open, somewhat open-ended and doesn't have a lot of definition, uh, but it, it's a research project data collecting project. And also we're gonna get some electric vehicles in place and some multifamily housing. So that's uh, an important goal. So thank you for considering this. And I, I strongly recommend that you approve the pilot project. Thank you very much. Thank you so much for your comment. Next, please. Hi, good evening. Um, you know, I really like attending the climate action meetings as well. Those meetings are really fun and you actually learn a lot. Um, you know, I was wondering, let's say I'm a homeowner in Albany and the city has this policy to where I have to install these uh, electric car chargers, um, but that also requires a panel a box upgrade as well. And Climate Action Committee, I think a student um, did a whole project on how to calculate, you know, what kind of panel you need. So I was wondering if some of this money can go towards the homeowners for some incentive to help upgrade the panel box, because I know that's a cost as well. Um, and the other thing I wanted to point out was we, we don't really have any long term studies on these electric car chargers. And I, I noticed on the news and the media, there's a lot of fires associated with electric cars. And I just want to put a notice out there that um, we're going to be installing all these car chargers on all these old houses in Albany. And some of the houses may have old wiring. I just want to raise a point of a fire risk uh, with these electric ch car chargers because there's a lot of wattage, a lot of voltage running through there, you know, probably 220. I don't know. Um, it's probably 110, really. But, uh, you know, just, just the fire risk, you know, at, at every single electric car charging station there should be a fire extinguisher installed next to it um and it should be the right type of fire extinguisher it should be the um electrical fire extinguisher or chemical or whatever it is but i think uh, it'd be really good uh to part add to the policy to where if we're going to implement this you know a fire extinguisher should be installed next to every single one just in thank you so much for your comment all right, I think that's all the public comments. I'll bring it back to council for last minute comments or questions at this time. If not, we'll go ahead and get a motion. Move this forward. <coughs> council member Clay, go ahead. Um, th thank you very much. I, I do think, <coughs> excuse me, I do think this is a great program. Um, I'm, a, I'm a little bit confused though. Does the property owner in, install the charging stations at their own cost? And I guess I'm trying to figure out what the incentive is to them. We're gathering a lot of data, which is great, but I'm not sure that helps them a lot. So did I miss something? Yeah, so there would be up to $15,000 of an incentive, which could be spent on a variety of things, including the installation of the charger. Um, it wouldn't probably cover all of the cost of installation definitely wouldn't cover all of the cost of the project. Um, for the building owner's perspective, um, they could theoretically make money from selling the electricity for the chargers at a slightly higher rate. And it's also, you know, a way to advertise your building to try to get new tenants. Um, theoretically, they could raise the rent because it's, you know, it's offering extra services. There are a variety of reasons that buildings might be interested. 
We know that there is demand for this because as I said, with the other programs, they fill up very quickly. Um, but you know, as, as Nick was saying earlier, we don't know exactly how much demand there's gonna be for this program and how exactly building owners would feel about it. So it is something to be determined. I think the last thing we wanna do is encourage building owners to raise the rent. Um, we might wanna rethink that marketing piece. But I, I do think it's a good idea. I just, um, it's, worth, it's worth trying. If it doesn't work, we can try something else. So that's, that's fine. Um, you know, I mentioned this before when we were talking about some other measure DD funding that I, I definitely think we need to be sure we have a comprehensive plan fairly soon with um, how we're spending this money and what it's going for and being sure that we don't overspend it. Um, you know, we're still in the very beginning stages, so we have some money, but we want to make sure we're budgeting it appropriately. Having said that, this is a good use for that funds. I smash go ahead, please. Um, so I'm happy to make a motion if there's no further comments. All right, I move approval of the um, multi-residence building electric vehicle charger support pilot program as proposed by staff with the uh, direction to talk to Energy Council staff just to get whatever experience and they might be able to, to help with. Um, and I'm happy to facilitate that if that would be helpful. I'll second the motion. Can we get a roll call, please? <coughs> Council Member Tiedemann? Yes. Mayor Gary? Yes. Vice Mayor Jordan? Yes. Council Member McQuaid? Yes. Council Member Nason? Yes. Motion carries. All right. Thank you so much for the presentation. Thank you. Next, go to line item number 12, where we'll ask council members <coughs> subcommittee reports, um, events, just getting reports from our council members. We'll start with Vice Mayor Jordan. Um, yes, thank you very much, Mayor. Uh, so we attended two meetings, uh, meeting of the Alameda County Mosquito Abatement District. Um, the news there is it voted to uh, join as a member to the um, Hayward Area Shoreline Planning Agency, which is an agency that among other things is planning for sea level rise um, and how to do horizontal levees and things like that. Um, and they extended a uh, offer of membership to the Mosquito District, which the Mosquito District took up because levees can be designed better or worse in terms of mosquito generation. Um, also then uh, had a meeting of the, the planning um, committee of the of Stop Waste Board and received a report from the statewide recycling board regarding what products are actually recyclable uniformly across the state as opposed to wish cycle. Is the idea you throw it in the recycle bin and you, you wish it's recycled. Um, and it's only number one and two plastic are, are actually recyclable statewide. Um, there is a state bill that was passed that mandates removing the chasing arrow symbols from things that are not actually recyclable in fact. So we'll be seeing some changes in that regard. Um, I also met with the executive director of Stop Waste uh, to discuss the potential unfunded mandate imposed by SB 1383 um, and their strategy and development to, to try to, how to deal with that, try to get that funded rather than unfunded. All right, thank, thank you. you so much. Council Member Tiedemann. Uh, I I don't think I've attended many events, though. Uh, I did want to note that the uh, ABAG uh, president uh, nomination period closed with only one nomination uh, for president and vice president. Uh, so we had an uncontested election. And our friend and neighbor, Jesse Aragreen, has uh, re-upped his term as president via that, uh, which is very exciting. So I'll be looking forward to working with him. All right, thank you so much, Councilmember McQuaid. Thank you. Um, as the uh, chair of the Housing Commission, I hosted a meeting of Albany property owners, and 
staff from HACA and Berkeley Food and Housing Project explaining options for providing housing in Albany through their respective agencies. And of course, was at the flag raising for the Confederated Villages of Lachon. Councilor Morrison. Uh, yes, I attended the um, Alameda County Transportation Commission's um, uh, Policy and Legislation Committee. There's nothing uh, there specific to Albany. Um, but then we did also have a meeting with personnel from uh, uh, Vice Mayor Jordan and I met with um, members of the uh, staff of the Alameda County Transportation Commission, as well as staff in Albany to talk about um, uh, uh, common interests with regard to transportation uh, issues. Um, I attended the uh, Lishan, uh, Confederated Villages of Lishan uh, flag ceremony. And um, uh, the I attended, uh, this is not strictly an Albany issue, but, uh, but does have implications for us. I did attend a uh, tour with the East Bay Regional Park District of um, Point Malate and, uh, the, and had discussion of the Bay Trail that is, uh, it would extend from us to them, uh, but also some discussion of Point Malate as a regional park. Um, that would also serve people from Albany as so it's only a few minutes away. And um, I think that's, uh, I think that's it for me. Thank you. All right, thank you. Um, I did attend the mayor's conference, Alameda County Mayor's Conference. We spoke about the Howard Terminal Ballpark Project. Um, mayor Shaft has invited the mayors to come out and do a tour and hopefully we'll be able to get that tour um, date Shortly, I'm not sure when that is. Good. What else we discuss? We had a presentation from the JPA uh, regarding the uh, wildfire prevention in the East Bay Hills. Uh, we had discussions of COVID nineteen issues in Alameda County from the healthcare service agencies, and that is all for me. All right. Like we're wrapping things up, I'll go around and ask for future agenda items. Councilmember Tiedemann. I don't think I have anything today. All right, Councilmember Nason. Nothing today. Councilmember McQuay. Not yet. Vice Mayor Jordan. Um, yes, I don't know if we'll be at the next meeting, but I put a, to put it out there, uh, I'll bring forward an item to the council regarding working with the Energy Council and authorizing staff to work with the Energy Council on uh, exactly what was raised earlier, potentially a, a program to help subsidize electrical panel upgrades in association with electrification of existing buildings. All right, thank you so much. And I don't have any at this time. But that said, line item number 14, our announcements of city meetings and events. Please govern yourself according to the um, events and meetings that will occur this week. Before we end, I want us to just take a moment to remember um, our former Secretary of State, General Colin Powell, who passed away due to COVID complications. Um, he's a very good man and he did a lot for our country. And so I just want us to just remember how life is so important and precious. And during these times, we do definitely need to make sure that we remain healthy and safe in our area. With that said, thank you to city manager, city attorney, council member Tiedemann, council member Nason, council member McQuay, vice mayor Jordan and staff for a wonderful uh, city council meeting. And don't forget public comments, our public, our residents that are out there lifting their voices for whatever we bring to this council to bring about change. I appreciate you and I hope you'll really continue to uh, join us at our council meetings. I'll see you in November. Have a good evening. Adjourn. Thank you, Mayor.